Consumers are facing inflation at record levels, and while it can seem scary, it doesn't have to be. Learn how to stretch your dollars when it comes to food, whether it's dining out or grocery shopping. We'll also show you the simple things you can do to keep your car on the road longer and save gas. But first, if you've done any shopping recently, odds are you've seen this option at checkout. Buy now and pay later. You get what you want immediately while paying over time. From fashion to filling up your gas tank, these are quick loans and they're everywhere. But here's what to consider before you buy now and pay later. You're borrowing money that you don't have from a company and then paying them back. You just want to get it over with. Fast and in fashion, buy now, pay later. The trend that gives you more buying power by breaking one big purchase into four smaller payments every two weeks. For example, you get a $100 shirt but only pay $25 now, then $25 every two weeks until the shirt is paid off. But it's not just clothing. Walmart recently accepting it for groceries, even Texaco and Chevron for gas, allowing users to split up payments as prices climb with inflation. Buy now, pay later allows you to get what you want right now, but critics say the easy lending can lend itself to reckless spending. It's easier to split up the prices. It makes you feel like you are paying less, but in reality, you aren't. 19 year old Ava Reinhardt is a full time college student who says she's overspent and missed payments using these loans. I definitely think it does enable me to like shop a lot more than I normally would. But for others like Erica Wright, a single mother of three, buy now, pay later has helped her get groceries in between paychecks. They are a lifesaver, to be honest. When you're able to use these apps to make large purchases that you may not have all of the money for up front, these apps come in super handy. Last year, Americans spent more than $20 billion with buy now, pay later services. The Federal Reserve says about half of those who use them say it was the only way they could afford their purchase. But a recent lending tree survey found 42% of users were late on a payment, which can hurt credit scores. A single late payment on your credit report can take 50 or more points off of your credit score. How do you avoid getting in trouble? One of the big things to know is yourself and your capability for managing your money. We see it as the safest way for people to use consumer debt. Damien Kasabji is the vice president of public policy for Afterpay, one of the largest buy now, pay later companies. He says unlike credit cards, which profit from high interest and revolving debt, Afterpay users get cut off after one missed payment. You drop them as a customer and eat that cost. Well, that's effectively correct. What we do do is pause the account and wait for the customer to come good on their payment before they're allowed to, to use their purchases again. Do yep, you absolutely. think they tempt people to spend or buy things they may not need or to spend more than they should? Look, I can't comment on whether someone is purchasing something that they need or not. What we do see from some of our retailers is that someone may have gone online and decided that they wanted to buy a shirt. And when they see that after pay is available, they buy the jacket as well. And they so buy the more than they intended to. They may have purchased something extra. Before you take out a buy now, pay later loan, experts say know the payment schedule. If you can, sync payments up with your paycheck and set up text and email alerts to remind you of upcoming payments. And one more tip. If possible, pay up front. If you ain't got it, don't try to spend it. <laughs> Right now, it is a bit of a wild west with these loans. Some will report your late payments to the credit bureaus. Other companies won't. And late payment fees, they're different for all of them. While it may seem like everything costs more these days, you can still find deals. There are some items that are inflation proof. We went on the hunt to find the items that have held their pricing. Take a look. From groceries and gas to housing and medical care, <laughs> ballooning prices have many Americans feeling the pressure. And yet some items have managed to escape the rising prices like this classic Costco hot dog. It's still a buck 50 and comes with a soda. Since its debut in 1985, Costco has never raised the price of this classic combo. And recently the club CEO telling CNBC it won't. Is there any inflationary environment where you would raise that price? <laughs> no. Costco views the popular mainstay as a loss leader, a product sold below market cost to attract customers. 
You can find these at other club stores. But another example at Costco, it's rotisserie chicken, holding steady at $4.99, despite a nearly 16% annual increase in chicken prices. But Costco has hiked prices elsewhere. They have raised the price on the soda by 10 cents and on the chicken bake by a dollar. So even Costco's not immune to inflation. No, the, Costco is trying to pick the areas where it can feel like it can pass along certain price increases. The standalone soda and the chicken bake probably are places where consumers may not be as outraged if they see a price hike. While the average American family now spends around $465 on groceries each month, several items can help alleviate some of the sticker shock. Tomatoes, potatoes, cheese, and ice cream all relatively unaffected by inflation, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor. No need to adjust your television set. You might just want to buy a new one instead. In the past year, TV prices have dropped almost 13 percent, meaning you could find a deal now without having to wait until the holidays or the beginning of the year. Smartphones also experiencing some dialed down prices, a 20 percent decline from 2021. And don't miss the call to save on jewelry, eyeglasses, and personal care items like cosmetics. Prices remain stable, but for those items not immune to inflation, prices keep going up. Do you have any mm -hmm. advice for how to handle it? Build up a certain cash cushion, and when you can become opportunistic about taking advantage of sales that you know you're going to use for products you know you're going to use, that's one way to kind of insulate yourself at least a little bit from price hikes in the future. Remember, you can find deals by shopping local and also some drug stores and convenience stores have expanded their variety of fresh food and they may offer lower prices than traditional stores, according to Consumer Reports. Well, higher prices have consumers changing their eating habits from home cooked meals to eating out. How to make the most of your food budget. Consumer Confidential is coming right back. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We need to pull up one extra chair at the table. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day, we start our morning so you can take on yours. Inflation is changing the way Americans are eating. These days, fewer families are eating out, and the rising cost of groceries has a lot of families looking for new options in the supermarket. Home kitchens these days are a mix of low price staples and takeout cartons where families are putting together quick, creative meals to deal with the soaring costs of food. With high inflation causing families to cut back on dining and entertainment, getting creative in the kitchen has become the new night out. Back in World War I, they said victory is in the kitchen, and I feel like we're right back to that again right now. Luckily, the bread baking, canning, and pickling skills many of us picked up during the pandemic are paying off in this season of high costs. What are some ways people can splurge on their meals and still make them feel special and still stay on a budget? Cook once, eat twice is a great way to stay on a budget. So if you have a favorite meal, maybe it's like a pad thai or something like that, and you cook it once, you can eat twice. So make enough to eat twice. So less effort, less money spent, making one big batch there. Another great way to do some of your favorite things is the supplementals. Use some of that kitchen equipment that you haven't touched in a while, that food processor, your blender. Those are all gonna be tricks and tips that are gonna help you get through this and save a little bit of money. 
In a recent survey by marketing firm Veracast, 61% said they've pulled back spending on restaurants and delivery over the last six months. And when families do order takeout, they're making those meals last longer, adding special ingredients from home. Maybe they'll order an extra container of rice, and then the next day combine that with leftovers to make a quick fried rice with this, you know, kind of a restaurant meets semi-homemade moment. It's a spicy condiment made with oil and chili flakes. Editors at thekitchen.com say folks are looking to stretch their dollars without giving up all the goodies. And I see people really kind of doing these high-low shopping moments where you might have bulk rice, bulk beans, but you're ordering this small batch salsa matcha from, from a small maker. Other ways to save without sacrificing flavor? Growing your own herbs and skipping expensive products that could easily be made at home. A jar of pasta sauce can cost up to $10 when you can make it for a fraction of that with a can of tomato product, whether it's pureed or crushed, an onion, some fresh garlic, and a little bit of chili flakes. It's much easier on the budget. Also, buying whole grains and plant-based foods can be healthier and cheaper than meat. What about cooking with ethnic or international ingredients and shopping at those different markets? Ethnic foods and international foods are a great way to get a ton of flavor without spending a lot of money. A lot of those meals are grain based already and you just have to pick up a few inexpensive spices. Embrace variety, experts say, and you might end up finding new comfort foods for less. Sales of food storage and preservation products are also skyrocketing, according to one market research firm, as people use leftovers to stretch their food dollars and they're also being more mindful of food waste. From food to cars, between inflation and parts shortages, car prices are sky high. If you're in the market for a new ride, you may want to consider holding off and keeping your vehicle longer. I spoke with a mechanic who showed us the ins and outs of how to keep your car on the road longer and even save some gas, too. For months, frustrated car buyers saw empty dealer lots and record high prices. New cars averaging nearly $46,000 each in April, up almost 13% from a year ago. And used cars average cost $30,000. That's a 22% increase in one year. It's prompting some to keep their cars a lot longer. Recent data shows that last year, the average age of vehicles on U.S. roads hit a record high of 12.2 years old. While keeping your car longer could save you money, you definitely want to avoid costly maintenance bills. But fortunately, there's some really simple steps you can take to keep those wheels turning. With me now is Audra Forden. She's a mechanic. She's also the owner of Great Bear Auto Repair here in Queens, New York. So Audra, what's your number one piece of advice when it comes to keeping your car running longer? My number one piece of advice to keep your car running longer is to be proactive and take care of the maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. That'll keep you safe on the road and prolong the life of your car. She says you can add years to your car's life and improve fuel efficiency right at the gas pump by using the correct fuel for your car. If you don't pay now, you're going to pay later. Putting in the right fuel makes all the difference on how optimal your car is going to run. 100%. How do you know what's the right octane for your car? Ah, okay. when you open up your fuel door, you're going to see a sticker there. It will let you know what kind of octane you use. Mm -hmm. If the sticker was removed or you don't see a sticker, check online, look in your owner's manual, and that will give you the information on what kind of fuel you need to use to fill up. She recommends checking your tire pressure once a month. We know tire pressure is important. Why is that? Tires are just like the shoes on your feet. They maintain the grip to the ground. Okay. There are safety concerns here. And by having the right pressure in your tires will also save you in fuel economy. So I see it says 44 PSI on the tire, but that's not actually the amount of pressure we want in the tire. That is the amount of maximum pressure that the tire can handle. Mm. So how do you know what's ideal for your car? Great question. Right over here is the sticker inside the driver's side door jam. 32 PSI is the correct pressure for the car. As the summer months get into gear, consider replacing your battery if it's more than three years old. Why? Your air conditioner puts extra strain on it. If you park your car outside, be sure to wash and wax it regularly because that will protect it from the sun's rays. What's the most important thing we can do to make sure we keep our cars out of the shop? <laughs> Ironically, the best thing that you can do is to take your car into the shop. Maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Mm. Taking care of your fluid flushes, your oil changes. Make sure that your coolant is at peak condition. All of those things is what's going to maintain the systems in the car so that you can stay out of the shop. 
And for oil changes, the old rule of thumb was every 3,000 miles, but most newer cars can go 10,000 or more. And in any car, never ignore this, the check engine light. If your ride is beyond repair and you have to venture into the marketplace, be flexible. Expand your search radius even hundreds of miles. Be open to alternative makes, models, and years. Research prices with Edmunds and Kelly Blue Book so you know the expected value in advance and search multiple websites and dealerships. Also, follow up. Sometimes sales fall through and a dealer may end up with a car on the lot ready to be sold. If you drive an electric car, the good news is they generally have less maintenance. But Audra said her most common repair for those electric cars, the calipers on the brakes. That's what brings the car to a stop and it recharges the battery. So if you hear any funny noises while braking, take your electric car to a mechanic to adjust those calipers. All right, the holidays will be here before you know it. When we come back, shopping strategies to save money and check off everyone on your nice list. And later, despite high prices, couples can still have the wedding of their dreams without going broke. The creative solutions for saying I do. A masked killer takes aim and fires. A fatal attraction that leads investigators to turn towards their own. Internal Affairs, a new podcast from Dateline. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love the ride. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Oh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. A masked killer takes aim and fires. A fatal attraction that leads investigators to turn towards their own. Internal Affairs, a new podcast from Dateline. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Before you know it, the holidays will be upon us, and retailers are unveiling deals earlier than ever. With inflation impacting prices, a lot of us are looking for ways to save while keeping spirits bright. Here are some strategies to make every penny count and check people off your list. Millions of Americans making their gift lists early and checking them twice for the best bargains, both online and in stores. Inflation still running at a 40-year high, impacting almost everything, including the toy aisle. How is inflation affecting the way we shop for toys? Per item, you're only looking at maybe a 2 to $5 increase. But when you're looking at your overall toy shopping and buying for multiple kids, that can add up really quickly. This year, many shoppers are looking to save money, with nearly 40% planning to start buying gifts earlier. And big retailers are paying attention. With the tap of your wand, the magic is real. Walmart revealing its top toy list last month, including a section for items under $25. And Target releasing its bullseye top toys list, featuring over 50 items starting at $14.99. Whether you're shopping in September, October, November, December, you have a guide to help you pick off the items that your little ones are sure to love this holiday season. Amazon also unwrapping its Toys We Love Collection Monday, featuring over 100 toys and games under $50 from Squishmallows to Magnetiles. With surging prices for necessities like food and gasoline, more than half of consumers reporting they're looking to use more coupons, discounts and sales. 
Grab what you need, put it up for the holidays and save Some heading to social media for advice on how to cut costs and spread holiday cheer. I'm almost finished my shopping list. Tiffany Timmons is a mom of three in Baltimore, sharing ways to save every day and for the holidays to over 630,000 followers on her TikTok, at Mama Likes to Save. Definitely get into those, those stores and look for the clearance because you'll be surprised. 90% off of a $20 item is $2. The best surprise this year? could be the toys that keep on giving. You want to look for toys that have lots and lots of play value, meaning that kids are going to get a lot of life out of them. Marissa from Toy Insider also recommends considering evergreen toys on clearance. Things like Legos, arts and crafts, games and puzzles. They're classics, they last a long time, and they can be a great way to save money, especially as those shipments of new and potentially higher priced toys flood the shelves. All right, from holidays to weddings, saying I do can be very expensive. But weddings are even more financially challenging right now as couples face high inflation. After two years of postponements due to COVID, a crush of couples are now heading to the altar only to find out love actually does cost a thing. It's prompting brides and grooms to find creative solutions to save on their big day. For those planning a wedding, this can sound more like this. Especially in 2022, when an estimated 2.5 million couples will tie the knot during sky-high inflation. 70% of couples already report spending more on their big day than originally planned. We're cutting the fat, like boom, boom, boom. And still, within like two weeks, we two already weeks, like doubled our double. budget. Yeah. Lynn Hazan and Tony Bush will say I do in July, after saying I don't to some of the usual wedding costs. Instead of an expensive venue, Lynn and Tony will exchange vows on their building's rooftop without a bridal party and just 60 to 70 guests. Every time somebody says we can't come, like, I'm kind of like, okay, so sad you're not coming, but okay. Also crossed off their list, a full-time wedding planner, a cake and fancy flowers. I don't remember my friend's weddings and going, they had great floral arrangements. What's important is what comes after. It's the honeymoon, it's buying a home. No matter how you slice it, planning a wedding is rarely a piece of cake. And with prices soaring for just about everything, it's giving a lot of folks a run for their money, including vendors. Butter, fondant, chocolate, really everything, cocoa butter, they've all gone up. While supply chain shortages have forced some vendors to increase their prices, cake artist Gray Pack says she's eating some of the extra costs. You are actually absorbing some of the costs and not passing them on to your couples. Why is that? Correct. Uh, well, Ingredients is actually a small percentage of the price. A lot of wedding vendors like musicians, photographers, cake artists, you're paying for their time and skill. Two ingredients that result in these masterpieces. Some cakes taking her up to 50 hours to complete. What are some things couples can do to save money? So some things that couples can do to save money in wedding cakes is actually looking at faux tears. It's actually styrofoam inside, but real on the outside. So none of your guests will know. Gray says faux cakes like this NBC Peacock inspired creation made at our request can cost around 20% less than real ones. Other ways to save, order a sheet cake for guests. Decorate with fresh flowers instead of sugar. Think of a crazy number and then it's going to be three times that crazy number. Jeremy Levy and Lauren Kammerling will walk down the aisle in October saying they can have their cake. Classic vanilla cake and rich chocolate cake. And eat it too. Oh my God, they're so good. <laughs> By eliminating wedding favors and selecting a lesser known venue, even if, like their own love story, it isn't love at first sight. Often the venue is the most expensive part of the wedding. Right. Mm -hmm. What did you yeah. do? So when we saw our venue, they had only, they had just started doing weddings. It was a brand new space and they were renovating it. It looked like, like a carpentry <laughs> site. It was just it was like, like a dude <laughs> in a hard hat, like cutting wood and like, like waving to us. According to Zola, an online wedding planner, other cost-cutting trends, weekday weddings at any time of the day. Now we're even seeing some brunch or breakfast weddings. It doesn't have to be super fancy. It doesn't have to be at night. It just has to be with the people who love you the most and who feel great. And, you know, maybe you're just serving a bacon, egg, and cheese. I would go there for sure.
NBC News parent company Comcast invests in Zola, where experts say couples can also send invitations. That's a big money saver. And brides and grooms-to-be can also add cash funds to their online registries, giving guests the opportunity to help cover wedding expenses, like the photographer, for instance, instead of buying a physical gift. By the way, Zoom weddings, those are still a thing. Some couples may decide to live stream their event, especially when they're having a destination wedding. To tip or not to tip, that is the question more businesses are asking consumers to pony up extra money at the register. How you can navigate that without sacrificing service. That's next when Consumer Confidential returns. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful so life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. <laughs> now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You may have noticed it, more businesses asking for and accepting tips. Sometimes it's at places you really wouldn't normally think about tipping. Consider it the guilt tip. So when is it appropriate to tip and how much should you give? Also, when is it okay to deny a request for a tip? Take a look. From dine-in restaurants to independent coffee shops and even the vet's office, the pressure to tip has reached a tipping point. I'm sorry to say this, but tipping culture has gotten out of control. Patrons often feel guilted into adding a few bucks to the tab as more places turn to those tablets with preset tipping options. I will be ordering from a kiosk and the kiosk asks me if I want to tip. Why am I needing to tip? With takeout and delivery booming since the pandemic, many are questioning if tipping is always necessary. I'm not tipping for my food arriving cold so you could make more money. Some service workers are striking back. Videos posted online reportedly show orders piling up for people who don't tip up front. No one in their right mind is going to want to go five plus miles for under $3 pay. And yeah, we could get a cash tip at the end, but it's so rare it's not worth the risk. The reality, delivery drivers earn a base pay. DoorDash says that ranges from 2 to $10 per order, depending on time and distance. And the company says 100% of tips are passed along to drivers. Other apps have similar pay structures. While at restaurants, bartenders and waitstaff are often paid below minimum wage. One study finding more than half of their earnings come from tips alone. For that reason, etiquette experts recommend tipping 20% for average dine-in and delivery orders. If you're ordering takeout, a tip is always appreciated, though the amount you give for carryout orders can be 10 to 15% of the bill. If somebody is providing a service for us, if they are serving us, if they are putting bags of food together, I think it's very important to tip. Still, there are situations where you can turn down the tip jar. Insiders say examples include picking up clothes from the dry cleaner or if you receive care from medical professionals. Even services from highly skilled workers like plumbers or electricians can be completed without the guilt tip. Do keep in mind, many service workers are dependent on the tips they receive to make ends meet. And while it was once customary to tip after service is complete, some workers are taking into account whether or not you tipped up front, and that could affect the quality of your service. Okay, that is our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. You can also catch me on NBC News Now weekdays from 12 to 2 Eastern.
For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Vicki Nguyen. Dreyer filling in for Carson today here on Popstart Plus. I'm so excited to bring you today's show. We've got Oscar winner Anne Hathaway, plus with Halloween almost here, a really interesting conversation with the actor who voiced Lucy in the beloved classic, It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. And we are going to round things out with a clip from our vault featuring the one and only Hugh Jackman. But first, Jacob Sobaroff has today's Popstart. A very special pop star correspondent this morning, one and only Molly Hunter joining us live with an update on the coronation of King Charles. Molly, hi, good morning. All the details, guys. Good morning to you. So for more than 900 years, coronations have happened right there at Westminster Abbey. Now, Queen Elizabeth had more than 8,000 guests in 1953. We're expecting something a little bit more scaled back for King Charles. With his reign already officially underway, a date has now been set for the symbolic start of the King Charles era. The palace announcing that his coronation will reflect the monarch's role today and look towards the future. The date, Saturday, May 6th, a departure from tradition. Queen Elizabeth's coronation was held on a weekday, a Tuesday back in 1953. The first televised coronation in history, and Charles, just four years old at the time, was among the thousands of guests watching his mother crown queen. Her presence will be strongly felt. Last month, Charles's first public address as king paid tribute to his beloved mother. Throughout her life, Her Majesty the Queen, my beloved mother, was an inspiration, an example to me and to all my family. The Archbishop of Canterbury will preside over the anointing, blessing, and consecration of King Charles, but there are likely to be a few changes. For example, Queen Elizabeth's coronation was nearly three hours long. Charles's expected to be smaller and simpler. Queen Elizabeth had some 8,000 guests inside the Abbey, but the capacity is only about 2,000, and guests may have a slightly more relaxed dress code compared to 70 years ago. Queen consort Camilla will also be crowned as part of the ceremony, reportedly wearing a crown created for the Queen Mother for the 1937 coronation of King George VI, featuring the famous 105-carat Corinor diamond. Now that is one heavy crown. Now no word yet on what roles King Charles's children or his siblings might play. Lots more details though, and we will get those straight to pop start, Jacob, when we get them. I'll send it back to you. <laughs> Molly Hunter with the details we have all been waiting for. Thank you so much, Molly. Coming up next, guys, Blake Shelton. We thought this day would never come, but get this, after 23 seasons, the country superstar is stepping away from the voice. So yesterday, Blake announced on social that next season will be Team Blake's final run. This is what he wrote. He said, the show has changed my life in every way for the better. It will always feel like home to me. I made lifelong bonds with Carson and every single one of my fellow coaches over the years, including my wife, Gwen <laughs> Stefani. Shelton's been with the series since it launched way back in 2011. He's the only coach to sit in one of those iconic spinning chairs for every single wow. season. And yesterday, by the way, The Voice also released the celebrity lineup who, who are going to join Blake oh. for season 23. Coming back. Kelly Clarkson, mm -hmm. along with newcomers Chance the Rapper oh. and Niall Horan. Okay. Cool. You know what I like? That Blake yeah. mentions Carson before Gwen. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it, it, it's just, it's this other uh, They're spell. very close. I know yeah. they are. I know they are. Can't wait to see what Blake's got in store for his next chapter as well. Congratulations, Blake. Uh, next up, Duran Duran. We know who is uh, going to love this next one, Miss Guthrie. Uh -huh. uh, get ready. After four decades of music, the Rock and Roll Hall of Famers are set to hit the big screen next month in a new documentary <laughs> concert <laughs> film. Okay, why are we look, at, look at that smooth. Because that's, 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 right. Right. that's your screen that's 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 well, Why is that only? Uh, well, there we are. You're well, having a good time. Me and Simon Levant. It's called uh, a Hollywood High. It's going to have a series of new interviews there with the go. band, never before seen archival footage. It should have that picture of you oh. and, and him in the uh, in the dock. Epic performance filmed on a rooftop right outside one of the great buildings in LA, ah. the Capitol Records building. Here's a peek. Cool. We were staying on Sunset at a hotel that was then called the Hyatt. It was known as the Riot House. There was no decent music coming out of Los Angeles. We were really, really hot. 
other entertainment news this morning. If you're a fan of Duran Duran. Duran Duran. Duran Duran has been honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Now to the reason we call this show Pop Start Plus. We have even more headlines for you. So let's start with MTV Cribs. Big news this morning for the show that became a cultural phenomenon in the 2000s thanks to celebrity home tours like this one. It's so small that I let the kids jump on it. Go ahead, kids, jump on the small bed. My bed is 15 feet long, 30 feet wide. I want it to be the biggest bed in the world, and this is the bed that they made me. It's what he needs. Just MTV just dropped a teaser for a new season, which is set to premiere later this month. Plus, they revealed the lineup of celebrity guests whose doors they'll be knocking on, including Charo, Macy Gray, Leslie Jordan, and many, many more. Here's a peek. The original All Access Home Tour is back. It's Who's got their very own love lounge? Who's got a slick snake pad? Where them snakes sit? And who's got the craziest car collection? I hope you enjoy Looking forward to that. The new season of Cribs premieres October 27th on MTV. And finally, Charlie Puth. If you follow him on TikTok, you've probably seen how Charlie can create full songs out of random sounds he hears around the house. It's actually how he wrote his recent single, Light Switch. Well, last night on The Tonight Show, Charlie broke down the process for Jimmy step by step and was able to make an entire song using the clicking sound from a mug. Check this out. You record little That's it. There's the sound of the glass. But if you pitch it down, so that's just one note. So this is what that sounds like here. Ooh, we got reverb. Uh, too much. Wait. So I could, okay, so that's one layer, and I could add a little rhythm to Again, that's the cup sound. Okay, so that's looping. Again, these are all just cup sounds pitched down. If I put a kick drum, then you have a completed. Uh, it's awesome. It's like a master class in making music. What? Wow. I just wanted to. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Next album. Uh, so that's the latest for you today. Coming up, the lovely Anne Hathaway on her latest movie. Stay with us. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. In the new movie Armageddon Time, Anne Hathaway plays the mother of a Jewish family navigating Reagan-era New York. She stopped by Studio 1A to tell us what it was like to film. Anne Hathaway has proven over the years she really can do it all. She made us laugh while rising through the ranks of the fashion world and the Devil Wears Prada. And she showed off her singing skills and acting chops with her Oscar-winning turn in Les Mis. Well, now, in the upcoming drama Armageddon Time, Anne plays a mother in 1980s New York who is determined to get the best for her son. It might be an option for you and your family moving forward because he may be a bit slow. Mm. 
My son is not slow. No, sir. Mrs. Graff. No, I've heard enough. Get up. Time to go. Anne Hathaway, good morning. Good morning. What a meaty role for you to yes. sink your teeth into Very this mother from 1980s Queens, New York. Mm. What drew you to this, this role? Oh, James Gray. The director. director, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I, I've been with uh, the people that I work with. I've worked with for a really long time. So my agent Josh called me up and he said I read something and I, I think you're gonna love it. And I said, "Who's the director?" And he said, "It was James." And I, I, I had to remind myself that I should read the script before saying <laughs> yes. But that had you in hello. <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh, yeah, he had me at the immigrant. He, he's an incredible director. And then when I found out what the script was about, how it's his personal story, it's based on his personal life, I thought, what an honor, what an honor to be someone. And and, and I'm playing the character based on his mom. I was going to ask about that. You know, the honor being honor, trusted, but yeah. also such a responsibility to, yeah. to play. <laughs> His mother, a character he knows presumably and, better than anyone else. And and you know it. You're a mom. You know that role is. It, it's so tender. It's so it's so remarkable. And and I know because I have a mother and I am a mother. It's so it's so central to one's existence. So, I found myself being um, not delicate, but just really sensitive when I was asking questions about his life and about what she was like. Because you never want to presume uh, within a relationship like that. You never want to take up too much room. But I still had to get information because I had to play a character. So it was always about. It's such a personal story. It's I mean, I feel like movies like this don't get made all that often anymore. Where it seems rare, right? Yes, and it's it's such a profound story. It's mm. deep, it's layered, but it's not a big action movie. I mean, you know, it, it's an opportunity for an, for an actress, like I said, to really sink your teeth into it. Well, it's a human story, yeah. and and we were playing people that we knew were real people, and so uh, being able to play something grounded, but also emotionally rich, dramatic, funny. That's the other thing about this family is they're funny. You know, and this is a, a story that doesn't shy away from showing some of the ugly sides of family. So we'll go from goofy to violent in a blink of an eye. And um, and it's a, it's a challenging film in that way. I heard you challenge your mom, your own mom, a little bit. At a little least bit. with the eye wear. Yes. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Brooklyn in the 80s. And so my mom was a mom in Brooklyn. I'm playing a mother in Queens. But uh, when they asked me what kind of eyeglasses my character wanted to wear, I knew exactly the ones. My mom wore these big tortoiseshell 80s uh, glasses. And we hunted and hunted and hunted. And and, and then we found them. They're amazing performances. As the young actors are incredible. Anthony Hopkins. First of all, I mean, okay, I you, mean. you've done a lot in your career. But I've been here very you are. lucky, yes. and, this, and that was a high, absolutely. So, I mean, what? How did you approach it? Like, was there kind of that intimidation factor? Oh yes, I, I tried not to be. I tried not to be, but my first day acting with him, I was non-functional. Like, completely. <laughs> when I say non-functional, I mean I couldn't. I couldn't get a line out. I had worked really hard at doing the oh. accent. Nothing came out. And like, you know, you're just jittery and nothing, nothing, nothing. And I've, I'm really lucky. Like I said before, I've worked with legends. And in the past, I would have gone home, beaten myself up, and that kind of would have been the job. But this time I thought, okay, it was a day. Shake it off. He's a legend. Anybody would trip in front of Anthony Hopkins. It's okay. Go back tomorrow and just be a person and mm. see what happens. And he's so lovely when you're just a person with him. Well, I heard you so kind of connected to the extent that now you're texting friends. Yes, we are. We do text. And he, I mean, <laughs> I, you I, like text I mean, from Anthony Hopkins. They're beautiful. Is it like prose or is it emojis? I mean, what? it's a combination. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's it's a little bit of both, but he's. Um, I hope this doesn't sound pretentious because I do mean it sincerely and literally. He's an illuminated soul, mm. and he's so generous with his perspective and his life experiences. And so I, I obviously, how could you not learn so much from him just as an actor? But I just learned from how to just about being a person, just being a human being in this world and in this business. And it was it was a joy and a gift. Oh, it's wonderful. I mean, let's just text him after. Let's send okay, him a selfie, no problem. Cause, just because you can't. Finally, I have to ask you about Fashion Week. OK. Everyone was so excited because we have to show the picture. Here you are next to Anna Winter, who famously was the inspiration for the Devil Wears Prada. You're looking like your character, Annie. Was this on purpose? <laughs> was this by just design? How did this happen? Look at you. I know that it was kind of nuts, wasn't it? It was by accident. I was supposed <laughs> to wear something else. The shoes didn't fit. This was the other outfit that came. And then uh, my hairstylist, who's so lovely, and I'd never worked with him before, just said, oh, I know what to do. And he threw my hair up in a ponytail. And I looked in the mirror, and I thought, oh, that's funny. I wonder if anybody will notice. <laughs> <laughs> we they noticed. noticed. Yes. <laughs> 
Well, you look good. I Thank love it. Thank you very it. much. And before we go, Savannah, I just have to say, my uh, cousin, who's like my sister, her son Noah is your number one fan. Oh. So I have to take this opportunity to just say hi, Noah, and let you know. That, that is so sweet. And hi, Noah. I mean, wow, what an honor. Thank you so much. Noah, I love it. Send him a video, <laughs> and then we'll text Anthony Hopkins. We're, we have a lot to so do. So much to do during the commercial break. So much to break. do. We got to get this going. Check out Armageddon Time, a beautiful and stunning movie from our sister company, Focus Features. It opens in select theaters on October 28th and nationwide on November 4th. We should mention Armageddon Time hits theaters on October 28th. Coming up, we are looking back at a Halloween classic. It's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, with the voice of Lucy. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about, and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about, and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You're back here with us on Pop Start Plus. Sally Dreyer was just eight years old when she was tapped as the voice of Lucy Van Pelt in It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. She shared memories of recording the beloved 1966 special and told us what it was like to work with Charles Schultz. Take a look. Voicing Lucy meant I could yell and get away with it. You blockhead, you're gonna miss all the fun just like last year. You blockhead. <laughs> poison dog lips is a good one too. Blech, ech, poison dog lips. Ugh, poison dog lips. Because I work with animals, so I know that dog lips aren't poison. I would describe Lucy as a brilliant, sarcastic character that we could all aspire to be like. My sister worked for Lee Mendelson, the producer at the time. I was eight years old. He had been pitching to Charles Schultz for years. I want to do a special. I want, they were friends. I want to do a special. I want to do a special. No, 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 no. Well, Charles Schultz called him one day and said, I have an idea, but I only want to use real kids for the voices. So my sister was sent with a reel to reel tape recording thing to all the grammar schools in the area and at the end of a couple of long days uh, she sat me down at the kitchen table before dinner and said I might as well try you so that's how I was selected for Violet however after that Charles Schultz decided I had a particular quality of crabbiness in my voice that and I was elevated <laughs> to the role of Lucy say Charlie Brown I've got a football so when we went to record um, what it meant was, at the time, because I was eight, it meant a day away from school. So I got to get out of school and my sister uh, generally, or another uh, production assistant who worked for Lee Mendelssohn would pilot all the voices in a car and drive us to San Francisco. We would go up into the recording studio and they would take us in one at a time to, to do our lines. 
however long that took, the rest of us would be riding the elevators and, you know, basically quite rowdy without any supervision. <laughs> we were all kind of close for the day, but we came from different schools. So then we'd separate. Then the next time we recorded, we would, we would have a great reunion. We were a wild bunch of kids that rode our bicycles until dusk every night during the summer, especially. So all the neighbors said, oh God, we'd know that voice anywhere. I guess I was loud everywhere I went. Charlie Brown, if you got an invitation, it was a mistake. Charles Schultz said at one point that all the characters were him. I would say my recollection of him is as though he's a little like Charlie Brown, but apparently he had a Lucy side as well. I rarely saw him, but we did meet on occasion when Lee Mendelssohn would want to do a special or do a photo op or something like that, and we'd all pile in the car again <laughs> and drive to Santa Rosa. I remember his demeanor was so sweet and quiet, and I got to stand next to him at his drafting table, and I vividly remember standing there and him telling me that he was working on a strip and I remember him telling me it's like doing a term paper every day and, and that's the genius of him is because every every strip has such deep meaning if you peel the, the layers off. A person should always choose a costume which is in direct contrast to her own personality. That was a dilemma that they had is because we all got fired when we hit 12 when our voices changed. So they had to seek out a whole new cast. Um, and, it, and it was important for them to find kids that sounded the same. So they really dug themselves a hole because that was a difficult thing. But, but I, I think true to now, even that last animated special um, that was, I don't know how many years, it's been five years or so, those kids sound like we did. And it's kind of amazing. <laughs> I think the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown is most beloved because of Snoopy. What in the world kind of costume is that? He's just everybody's dog. You know, everybody loves their dog and, and knows their character and knows, but, but Snoopy is this, this human yet canine wonder. I mean, it's a long way to Tipperary. He's rising up out of the pumpkin patch. That's the pivotal point in that show that really is so endearing. And then good old Lucy going to pick out her brother, freezing to death in the pumpkin patch the day after Halloween, because Lucy really does have a heart for her stupid little brother. Yeah, if you ask people around me, you, I, I would definitely say they think I'm Lucy. I live in a little town of 400 people and, uh, I'm kind of bossy with the whole town. Lucy would have grown up to be a volunteer vet tech, a, a sculptor, picture framer, and a store owner. <laughs> My partner and I live in Jerome, Arizona, and we have uh, the largest kaleidoscope gallery in the world. And so mostly American made kaleidoscopes and art glass, kind of the uh, the gears of the place. It's called Nellie Bly, kaleidoscopes and art glass. I got a popcorn ball. I got a fetch ball. I got a pack of gum. I got a rock. Being part of this phenomenon, I don't identify with it personally now, other than I played that role as a child. Who would have thunk? <laughs> that it would be so synonymous with the 60s and on memories of the 60s for people my age. So cool, there's so much in that conversation about Peanuts and its creator that I just never knew. Up next, a flashback with Hugh Jackman chatting about his iconic role as Wolverine. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky, to cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now.
These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. <laughs> the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. Hugh Jackman has been a favorite around here for a very long time. So we thought today, on his birthday, we'd look back on his visit here in 2000 when he was knee-deep in playing Wolverine. Okay, everyone, the mutants have taken over the box office, that is. This weekend, X-Men, the movie based on the wildly, po wildly popular comic book series about mutant superheroes, toppled Scary Movie and The Perfect Storm, taking in more than $57 million. Hugh Jackman plays the lead character, Wolverine. You're in my school for the gifted, for mutants. You'll be safe here from Magneto. What's a Magneto? A very powerful mutant who believes that a war is brewing between mutants and the rest of humanity. I've been following his activities for some time. The man who attacked you is an associate of his called Sabretooth. Sabretooth? Storm. What do they call you? Wheels? <laughs> this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. The Cyclops, right? <laughs> Get out of my way. And a clean shaven Hugh Jackman is here. Hi, no Hugh. Claws. Nice I to can see guarantee you. No clothes. Thank you. Good, good to see you too. Good morning and congratulations on Thank the you. tremendous showing at the box office. Were you surprised? Yeah, I think we're all surprised. Uh, I did a film in Australia a little while ago when it was released, and about a month after it was released, I got sent a bottle of champagne. They said, fantastic, great news. And on the note, it said, we've just hit $1 million in the box office. So, <laughs> So this like, is a big change of pace, huh? Well, the first, I got a call on Saturday morning say, you will never believe it. We've made 20 million in one day. And I was like, I've been like this all weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Meanwhile, anyway. you, you didn't really know, like Anna Paquin, uh, I spoke with Anna on Friday, you weren't that familiar with this whole cult of the X-Men. It is huge. I had no idea. I didn't grow up reading the comic. Uh, I, I was aware of an Australian rock band called the Uncanny X-Men, but that was about it. Uh, and so when I got involved with the project, I sort of started cramming. And I was every morning in the makeup trailer, I'd be reading, 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 reading. And of course, now I'm a fan. You know, so, what, so what's the appeal, you think? It's, a, it's more layered. It's the thinking person's comic. And that's how it was sort of billed and known when it was first out there. I mean, the people who read X-Men are still reading it when they're 40. Believe me, I've met many of them. I mean, oh. they are, they're fanatics, and in fact, oh, some yeah. of them were not very excited, frankly, Hugh, when you were cast in this role. I know that you, <laughs> you have a website, and you got a lot of not very complimentary comments. <laughs> Vitriol I mean, they I were like, yes. this guy stars in musicals. He played Curly in Oklahoma. Yes. He was in Beauty and the Beast. What the heck is he doing as Wolverine, right? It kind of, I, I was expecting that. I mean, uh, in a way, it's a blessing because no one knows who you are. So the main reaction was, who is this guy, you know? Um, so they had to wait to the movie to find out. Thank goodness the fans are behind it. But uh, I'm actually pretty thin-skinned. I didn't even look at them. But uh, people I met said, "Oh, you should have seen what they wrote about you this morning." You know, how do you even go out of the house in the day? You know, it was uh, vitriol. Is exactly how I like to describe it. So your background is primarily. I know you've done some TV work and mm -hmm. that that big uh, money maker movie that you did, <laughs> one million dollars. Exactly. But primarily, it's stage work. Yeah, I've done a lot of stage work. Can um, you sing like, oh, what a beautiful morning for us? Uh, this morning? Yeah. Let's go to the tape. No. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. Look at your face. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's the good. The corn is as high as an elephant's eye. And it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. That'll do it. That was very good, Hugh. Thank you.
How cool is that? And I think 22 years later, he's still portraying Wolverine. Happy birthday to you, Hugh. Well, that's going to do it for today's Popstar Plus. And again, we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. The hills are alive with the sights and smells and tastes. Ah, come on. It's a food show. Now, nothing says autumn quite like apple. Whether it's a trip to an orchard like this, a warm slice of apple pie, or cheering with cider. But when did apples become the apple of America's eye? I left the Big Apple, and I'm here in Massachusetts, where America's history with apples actually began. So today, we are going to get to the core of how apples became a homegrown hero. How do you like them apples? Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. My family and I have been coming here to Hilltop Orchards in Massachusetts for the past 20 years. That's right. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better fall family activity than apple picking, and especially the apple cider donuts. And of course, what also pairs well with a trip to orchards? Cider. And they make a lot of it here at Hilltop. Oh, and did I mention the donuts? Meet David and Sarah Martell, high school sweethearts who reconnected in their 30s. Together, they run Hilltop Orchards. We're definitely an apple orchard, but we're also a winery and a cidery, so we're a triple threat. Today, David handles the operations of the orchard, cidery, and winery, with Sarah focusing on guest experience. The orchard's historic cider mill, where David played as a kid, was renovated in 1997. Now, they call it home. I started coming to this orchard when I was about six years old. My father worked here then. David left the Berkshires and worked in construction for several years. When he decided to return home, he really went back to his roots taking a part-time job at Hilltop. I've been in the orchard business for about 12 years now. David's the third generation in his family to work on the 100-something-year-old orchard. Did you ever think that you would be running the orchard someday? Nah, in a million years. I quickly fell in love with these apple trees and decided that's what I'm going to do, diving in and learning about all the different apples and the history of apples. And that history is pretty sweet. I like to think of myself as an apple nerd. <laughs> My name is Amy Traverso, and I'm the senior food editor at Yankee Magazine and the author of the Apple Lover's Cookbook. Crab apples are the only variety indigenous to North America. Sweet apples were introduced to America by early colonists in the 1600s. Sweet apples have their origins in this area of Western China, sort of the border between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, called the Tian Shan Mountain Range. Those apple seeds came over with the Jamestown expedition, and trees were planted at Plymouth. But in the early days, colonists weren't making pies and tarts. Most apples grown in America at that time were more likely to be turned into cider than eaten. Apples played a very important role when there was people coming from England. As they say on the boat, they would make hard cider because that cider would last where water might spoil and someone would get sick. This trend continued stateside. By 1775, 10% of all New England farms had a cider mill. Today, I am at B.F. Clyde Cider Mill in Old Mystic, Connecticut. Meet Amy Harrison and her daughter, Sarah Monk, fifth and sixth generation owners of Clyde's. We're the last original steam-powered cider mill in the United States. 
back in you know the 1800s, early 1900s, everybody had a cider mill that had a farm. We use the same press, it's the same mill, and not many people get to go to work and put their hands on a lever and say, you know what, my great-great-grandfather did this same thing back in 1898. Cider was really important to early America because it was relatively easy to make. People had apples in abundance. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams famously loved it, drank it every day. Children drank it because it was low in alcohol, but it was often safer than water. Water could often be contaminated at that time. These days, Americans don't drink as much cider as the founding fathers. Two things happened to kind of bring the apple to its knees. We had immigration from Germany and Czechoslovakia, which were beer growing regions. Beer took over as the major American drink. Another reason behind cider's decline? Prohibition. Apples were very strongly associated with cider at the time. They were really seen as a source of alcohol. My great-great-grandmother was arrested twice, never convicted, but arrested twice for um, bootlegging. In the 1930s, Apple's sinful image was reborn as shipping methods improved. Sweet apples from Washington State could be transported all over the country, and the industry grew. Apples then had to be remarketed as just a dessert thing, as something you bake with or eat fresh from your hand. And so apples, they went through this rebranding and emerged as this sort of innocent, sweet fruit that wasn't going to get you drunk or do anything naughty. It was just going to make a nice pie. <laughs> Now, even hard cider is making a comeback, due in large part to the craft beer boom in the late aughts. Gluten's having a moment, so people are shying away from a lot of beers. Cider is fermented apples, and that's it. Where a lot of other beverages or mixed drinks or anything of that nature could have a lot of preservatives and different things added to them. Today, Americans are drinking 10 times more cider than a decade ago, and that's meant big business for Hilltop. Most of our guests are cider enthusiasts that are relatively new to the cider craze. Hilltop making around 1,500 gallons daily, and I got a chance to give it a try, or a press. They say time to make the donuts, it's time to make the cider. So here's some gloves, I see okay. you brought your boots. Yeah, I did. The process starts with freshly picked apples that are washed thoroughly. Next up, culling. As Benjamin Franklin once said, the rotten apple spoils his companion. They're sorting through what's coming down the conveyor. This apple has some dings and bumps. The good apples are sent to the grinding wheel. And they will get ground up to an applesauce consistency. Now it's my turn to prepare the ground apples for pressing. So it's like an apple sludge diaper. That's it. Then the apples get pressed down to the last drop. That's 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Up until this point, the process for sweet and hard cider is the same. Excellent. And nobody got hurt. Sweet cider would be bottled at this stage. For hard cider, the fermentation process begins. So sweet cider becomes more popular once we can refrigerate apple juice to prevent it from fermenting. In the mid-20th century, cider stands and apple picking became an American pastime, a tradition my family's enjoyed for more than 20 years each fall. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about, and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe.
you get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. There's just something about apple picking that inspires my best dad jokes. What apple sayings have you heard? There's a lot of um, insider sayings. <laughs> okay, I, I got one for you. Okay. okay. They say the family that plays together stays together. The family that picks together sticks together. There you go. As far as my kids are concerned, my jokes are as much a part of our annual tradition as the apples themselves. It's like, oh, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> my family's been coming to Hilltop for more than 20 years, even before my two youngest were born. I don't know if it's something about the season when apples ripen and it's starting to get cooler, and you're thinking about like comforts of home and coziness. People have very intense emotional connections with apples. Agritourism in the United States started becoming popular during the Industrial Revolution, when city dwellers looked to nature for recreation. Labor shortages during and after World War II saw farmers calling for volunteers to help pick crops. By the 1960s, enterprising farmers recognized America's love for apples. In the fall, the you-pick tradition became a profitable pastime at orchards all across the country. Is there a right way or and a wrong way to pick an apple? Spoiler alert, there is a wrong way. The problem with twisting and pulling the apple is that if it is not ripe, you're going to also get next year's apple. Can you show me? I can. So this is an apple that I know is not ready to pick yet. Okay. So if we were to lift up on this, uh -huh. if it was ripe, it would come free. Right. So it did not come free. Okay, right next to it is some Macintosh apples. Okay. And if you go ahead and lift up on one at a kind of a, at an angle into the sky, it comes it comes Just free. Like that. So that means that it's ripe. Okay, and the other thing is, well, that's the worst thing you can do when oh. you're picking an apple. So we we treat these like eggs and oh. we place them in place the bucket. Them in the bucket. There's sometimes little brown spots on them. That's from fingers. Oh. So the worst thing that you can do to somebody with a farm stand or, or a fruit grower is grab their apples and start squeezing them. I do like the honey crisp. Honey crisp yeah. it is. I was gala, but uh, okay. I've moved to the honey crisp. With an empty nest, I thought this year's Roker family trip was going to look pretty different. But then I heard from my boy at college. Nick was very adamant about Okay, are you going to come pick me up so I can go apple picking? Because I thought, this will be the first year we don't have anybody to apple pick with. Much to my delight, the family that picks together does stick together. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. fans ready to unlock our true crime mysteries try dateline premium on apple podcasts you'll get early access to originals plus bonus content and everything is ad free so head to apple podcast now to subscribe a masked killer takes aim and fires a fatal attraction that leads investigators to turn towards their own internal affairs a new podcast from dateline listen now wherever you get your podcasts Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. A masked killer takes aim and fires. A fatal attraction that leads investigators to turn towards their own. Internal Affairs, a new podcast from Dateline. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. 
Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I only have pies for you. American Pie is certainly an American icon. And in Southern California, one local family's pies have achieved all American status. And this holiday season, they're gearing up to make over 50,000 of these each week. I love apple pie. I, every time I eat apple pie, I think, man, my mom just hit it out of the park. I'm Dave Smothers. I'm Tim Smothers. And our mother started the Julian Pie Company in 1986. From a young age, Liz Smothers developed a passion and a knack for baking. She often tells a story of standing on a milk crate next to her mom. I was probably four or five years old. I would crawl up on a box and take the little leftover pieces of dough and put them in a jar lid. I would put the little apple in my jar lid and cover it, and she would bake it in the oven just along with hers, and I would eat it. I would say that if I had not had that experience, I would never be in the pie business. In the early 80s, the Smothers family moved to Julian, California, a picturesque mountain town near San Diego. Funds were tight, so my mom uh, ended up taking odd jobs. When we moved here, I had to go to work. The only place that a job was available was in a bakery. And uh, I, I tell you, after I started working with pie making, that old love just came right back. That love was mutual. Liz's pies were in high demand at the local bakeries where she worked, quickly gaining a loyal following. She had built up a reputation. There were stories that they would go in and go, well, I want one of her pies, and point at my mom. A historic gold mining town, Julian thrives thanks to agriculture, namely its award-winning apples. So once we came out here to Julian, and uh, she saw the opportunity. She just never looked back. Wild horses couldn't have stopped me. Honestly, I was not thinking of how much money can I make. I just was dying to make a, a good pie like my mother made. Two years after moving to Julian, Liz opened her own shop, the Julian Pie Company. She was 50 years old. Prove it. It's never too late to embark on a dream. My mom baked 120 pies, and she sold out the first day. It was a, it was a great grand opening. In this shop, there's an apple pie for everyone. It's the apple crunch with vanilla ice cream. It's not too sweet and it's really fresh. This is the most amazing pie I have ever had in my life. From cherry apple to apple rhubarb, today, Julian has 15 unique apple pie varieties in rotation. Thank you so much. The most popular seller is the Dutch apple. My mom's kind of joke was that that's the pie that pays our rent. Today, the busy bakers here make up to 10,000 pies a day. Pie production beginning around 3 a.m. It's no surprise that fall is their busiest season. Thanksgiving's the Super Bowl, and, uh, and Christmas is like uh, another Super Bowl. The pies are primarily made by hand, starting off with four ingredients. Pie crust is just flour, water, shortening, salt. That's it. It's the way you handle the dough so you get a nice short bread crust rather than a chewy crust. The brothers say their mom had a gift for knowing just when to stop kneading to make it perfect. If you don't get the dough right, you might as well not have the business. Miguel's worked with my mom. He knows exactly the precise measurements of how to do things. We add a few hundred pounds of flour, very ice cold water. The twin arm mixer blends the dough. That's what I think of his grandma's hand. The 400 pound batch of dough heads to the extruder, where it's cut into individual portions. So a 9.2 ounce puck falls into a pie shell, smashes the dough into a perfect shape, then they go into our freezers and we use them as needed. Next up, assembling the pies. Apples are peeled, sliced, then spiced. Cinnamon, sugar, and salt. This is all my mom's original recipe. There'll be a little bit of butter. Every time that dumps, I just get giddy. I'm like, yes, we hit it out of the park. So these pies have all been packed. They're nice and round, kind of like a mushroom. Patty's going to begin lifting, which is separating the, uh, the, the crust from the pie tin. If you don't do this step right here, that pie will bubble over in the oven. My mom was a queen fluter. The pies are brushed with an apple cider egg wash before baking. 
Then they're cooled, boxed, and ready to be shipped. Julian's Pies are sold in hundreds of stores, including big grocery chains like Albertsons, as well as mom and pop shops throughout San Diego. My name's Sierra Smothers. I'm Liz Smothers' granddaughter. I grew up baking pies with my grandma. This job was actually my first job in high school. These days, Sierra pitches in wherever she's needed, including driving the delivery truck. I said, Sierra, do you want to spend the day with your dad and help me deliver pies? And she, of course, jumped at the opportunity. So we had a whole day together delivering pies. Everybody loved it. <laughs> Julian now has two locations, employing almost 70 people. So many admire their company's founder. It's the best boss. No, everything I do is very, how would Liz want it, want it done? Liz's perfectionism and attention to detail is really what's brought this company to the magnitude that it is. And if we don't carry that on, then what are we doing? <laughs> Liz passed away peacefully, surrounded by family in May. But her legacy lives on through the beloved recipes her family works hard to preserve. I just hope that she's looking down and whatever that we do, we, we have her in our hearts and uh, that she's proud. Oh, this is where you get choked up. <laughs> now it's very, uh, it's very special. I really miss her. Um, she left a, a huge legacy with big shoes to fill. As for the future of Julian, the Smothers continue to welcome customers old and new with open arms. Come again, sweetie pie. That's my mom. Coming up next, a North Carolina family is giving candy apples a glow up with their colorful and creative creations. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. A masked killer takes aim and fires. A fatal attraction that leads investigators to turn towards their own. Internal Affairs, a new podcast from Dateline. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. How do you make apples even sweeter? Well, you dip them in candy, of course. Candy apples have long been associated with boardwalks and state fairs, but there's one entrepreneur in North Carolina who's taking this traditional treat to a whole new level with a colorful twist on the classic coating. My name is Kim Battle, and this is my husband, Travis Battle, and we are the owners of Candy, Candy Apples, Apples by K. K. Thank you. Thank you all. I would describe Candy Apples by K as the world's first hard candy candy apple shop. We specialize in the hard candy apple that started out with the traditional carnival treat, and then we've expanded that to different colors, different flavors. According to most historians, American-style candy apples were invented in New Jersey in the early 1900s. They're known for that signature cinnamon-flavored red shell until now. I like the uh, tropical punch. My favorite flavor is turtle. I would certainly say that the variety makes them special. For Kim and Travis, this treat has an especially sweet history. Candy apples have always been a favorite. My husband used to bring them to me when we were dating. And then when I threw his surprise 40th birthday party, I wanted him to have gold candy apples as a favor. We found someone to make them. And then she encouraged me, you know, you can make these yourself. You can do this yourself. Wanting to enjoy candy apples year round, Kim began developing unique candy recipes at home. Her kids, her first taste testers. Eventually, 
it picked up and neighbors and friends would say, oh, I would buy some from, from you if you have some. And I thought, let me start an Instagram page and see how many people are interested in candy apples. At this point, I'm working full time still uh, as an accountant. And on the weekends, I would start doing markets to offer these candy apples. When Kim got laid off, she saw an opportunity to pursue her dream full time. There's never been a storefront that just focused on candy apples. And you love going in a cupcake shop and you're like, ooh, all the flavors and the beauty of having the case displayed of all these treats. And I thought that would be so yum to have the same thing, but just in candy apples. Candy Apples by K officially opened in April 2019. A line of eager patrons stretched down the sidewalk on opening day. Any dream of hers, I'm definitely going to support it. It's going to become my dream as well. So we took off with it. Today, Kim and her team make over 40 different flavors and rotate their offerings each week. The process starts, of course, with fresh apples that Travis picks up from local farmers markets each weekend. Those are pretty. In our opinion, the Granny Smith apple is the best apple to use. That tart, hard, crisp apple is perfect against sweet candy. The apples are washed thoroughly in vinegar and hot water to remove that waxy coating. And it creates a smooth surface for the candy to be applied to. In the candy apple world, this is a dirty apple and this is a clean apple. The apples need to dry for 24 hours or else the candy coating won't stick properly. And this might just be my opinion, but the more I've dipped, I feel like covering the apple all the way to the stick is ideal for presentation. Kim's candy starts with a base of sugar, corn syrup, and water heated to 300 degrees. Then flavor extracts are added. She's experimented with dozens over the years, including blue raspberry, sour watermelon, and pina colada. And while we couldn't get her to divulge exactly how she gets those eye-popping colors, Kim did reveal one secret. Making sure that you're using bright colors and that your candy is not transparent would also be a key to making sure that you have a beautiful apple. Many apples get a little extra love with candy pieces or nuts. The store now offering a variety of dipped treats, including candied grapes and chocolate dipped fruit. But the classics are always on standby. Our family favorites are definitely still the carnival, the turtle, which is caramel, milk chocolate, and pecans is also a huge favorite. It's one that we can slice and share with everyone. And they really do mean everyone. We have five kids ranging uh, ages 2 to 22. They all contribute something different even to the family business and they're very familiar with candy apples. They're so used to seeing them that I think the five-year-old's first word was apple. It was apple. <laughs> Elena, the couple's oldest, works at the shop. She also handles their social media to help boost business. This is carrot cake. I feel it's really brought her out of her shell. I mean, she was an introvert and very quiet, but this has really blossomed her into being a lot more outgoing and engaging in conversation with customers. The younger kids continue to taste test while Travis pitches in where needed. He works full time, but still in the evenings at night, he's washing apples, he's stocking the store, he's getting all our supplies. I think often like, I don't think I could have done this with anybody else but him. Kim, owing a large part of her success to a generation that came before. Our moms played a huge role as well. Travis's mom was so precise in developing a process and a lot of the ways that we dip and a lot of our little tricks and secrets came from, from her. And then my mom working the store, um, she was actually washing apples as well. She's grateful they were able to enjoy her success early on. Last year, last April, uh, my mother-in-law passed away and after losing her, that was very traumatic and hurtful for our family. She was the matriarch of the family. And so two weeks later, my mom passed and we weren't expecting that of, you know, either situation. We are definitely keeping them a daily part of our lives, remembering everything that they've taught us and instilled in us, um, knowing how uh, tickled they were about how far the business had come. I don't think there's a day that goes by. That 
that we don't talk about them or think about them. A lot of times when we're doing things, we can kind of feel their peaceful spirit with us and encouraging us and pushing us. And without that, I don't know that we could continue, you know. And just like their mothers, Kim and Travis are passing down many lessons to their children. I believe some of the things that the kids have learned by watching Kim run the business is resilience, patience, love and passion. You know, a great job managing both. Apples are a true American icon. At their core, they're a shining example of innovation and versatility, and their place in U.S. history is one of patriotism and pride. But most of all, they foster a sense of togetherness. For Ana de Armas, the road to leading ladies stardom has been a fight to the top. <laughs> She burst onto the scene in action-filled blockbusters like No Time to Die, Blade Runner 2049, and this year's The Gray Man. Remove yourself from my personal space. It feels to me like you started pretty big. Oh my gosh, it feels so slow. <laughs> slow, perhaps, if you start from the very beginning. The 34-year-old was born in Havana, and raised in a small town outside of the city, a galaxy away from Hollywood. I'm curious where this acting thing came from. When I was growing up, we only had two channels on the TV. We, we didn't have VHS videos or anything like that. The times for the movies and novellas and things like that were the times. I better do my homework. <laughs> dust the, the furniture and help my mom in the kitchen before that time because nobody was going to move me from the couch. I would just watch whatever was on TV and, and run to the mirror and repeat it and do it again. At 14, she enrolled in the National Theater School of Havana. Is it true that you hitchhiked to drama school? <laughs> yes. It was quicker than getting the bus, so <laughs> I needed to get there on time. Clearly it went well enough that you made the decision that this could be a career for me. And as you said, you went to Madrid. Oh, it was, it That's was a leap. always the one thing. That was it. That was it. No other options. I don't know what I would have done <laughs> otherwise. After some success in Cuba, De Armas moved to Spain to pursue acting, landing a regular spot on the popular teen drama El Internado. No le interesa que estemos juzgando lo que está pasando. No lo ha pensado. So what was that decision like with your family to say, I really want to do this, and I'm going to go to Spain to, to pursue my dream. As soon as I said it, both of my parents were, you know, they were like, go ahead. And we trust you, and that, that trust in me gave me, you know, the, the final, you know, push to go. And I did it. Mm -hmm. I was not leaving, you know, I was not fulfilling anybody else's Right. dreams. They're not actors. They were just happy for me. And I had it so clear that I just think they would have never dared to stop me. And then you had great success there. A great success. I think it was okay. I, I think I started doing TV in Spain and I wasn't, it just didn't feel uh, the way I thought it would. And I was frustrated and I'm not very patient. <laughs> <laughs> That impatience prompted a move to Los Angeles in 2014, where she learned English phonetically to land her first roles. What was that audition like? You said, by the way, I want to be in this movie with Robert De Niro, but yeah. I don't speak English. But my character was Panamanian, so right. I was lucky. That helped. <laughs> I had time. I had some time to, to learn some English. <laughs> what was that like for you to go from Cuba to Spain doing television all of a sudden boom. Oh, it was incredible. Movie. It was it was a, an incredible experience. I, I just I couldn't believe it. And I brought my mom to Panama and then I brought my dad. I mean everybody. I just wanted them to to see, you know, and to to be proud and to experience mm -hmm. that too. So I didn't know if it was gonna happen again. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, right. You, you never know. know. Yeah. That was incredible. Truly like Amazing. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide. 
How's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day. Lighten your load every single morning. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. <laughs> love you too. <laughs> I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide. How's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day. Lighten your load every single morning. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Day Armis' break came in the 2015 movie Knock Knock, starring opposite Keanu Reeves. There's something we have to learn from each other. But it was her performance as Nurse Marta in the hit 2019 whodunit Knives Out that caught the attention of audiences and earned her a Golden Globe nomination for Best Actress. I'm gonna give you an emergency shot of naloxone so you don't die in 10 minutes. I take it when you read the part, you weren't that excited about it originally, is that true? I was in the middle of shooting another movie and it was a, the character description was Latina ter- caretaker, right. pretty, something like that. And one scene. I'm like, I've heard this before. <laughs> I don't think a nurse, no. And I just kept saying no, 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 truly because I was very, you know, in the middle of filming mm-hmm. something. And until, you know, they were like, okay, we'll send you the script. Oh, and they as, did. Oh, yeah. And as soon as I read it, I was like, oh my God, I need to send this tape now. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot lose this part. A breakout role where she was flanked by A-listers. You're a pack of vultures at the feast. Now, De Armas steps out from the ensemble cast onto her own in the Netflix movie Blonde, playing Norma Jean Mortensen, known to the world as Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe only exists on the screen. People have preconceived notions about Marilyn Monroe. They know the subway great. They (laughs) know happy birthday, Mr. President. But where did you begin to try to get to know her so you could play this part? So it was kind of like a slow process of discovering who, not just the movie star was, but who was Norma Jean. I didn't know that much about her. Uh, I'm Cuban, I saw maybe a few movies of her, so everything was uh, a big discovery. So given that you didn't know much about her, when someone came to you and said, they're making a movie of this book, Blonde, yeah, and they're thinking about you for Marilyn Monroe, this iconic figure, what was your reaction at first? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, Andrew saw me when I did Knock Knock. And right away, he called my agent and told him, this girl, you know, I want her to be Marilyn. Wow. And my agent was like, she doesn't speak English. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so I think Andrew put that aside for three years. And then, you know, three years later, he called my agent again. Hey, this actress, I still, I'm still thinking about her. Can I, can I see her? So they sent me the script and I met with Andrew like the day or two days after. And the first thing I told him was, is this a horror movie or mm. what is going on? Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, kind of, you know, pretty much. And that was the beginning of, you know, understanding what he wanted to do with this film. What was his intention and what, what, was, uh, what was the lens that we were telling this film through. Blonde is not a biopic. Based on the novel by Joyce Carol Oates, the film is an emotional, graphic, often uncomfortable interpretation of the difficult life of an American icon. I guess I was discovered. I think that 
The movie does present this, this idea of the perception that we have of success and fame and glamour. I feel like in the movie shows the other side of that and the price that you pay for that. People wanted Marilyn, they wanted that product. She had to keep delivering that because the opposite was nothing. Mm. She, she, was, she was nothing else. She was not considered anything else. I can't face doing another scene with Marilyn Monroe. Do you remember the first time you looked in the mirror and saw yourself as Marilyn? Yeah. What was that like? <laughs> um, I don't even I don't even know how to describe it. It was like I um you know everyone in the room started crying. I can tell you that it was it was very emotional. It was it was felt like she was back or something. I don't know. <laughs> and that breathy voice that everyone is so familiar with and yeah. the look and everything else. Yeah. How hard did you have to work? Well, Not the, just to get the accent, but the way she speaks. Yeah, that, that's the thing. First of all, I think people is familiar with the on-screen voice. Right. Which, from movie to movie, also changed. Mm. So, she, she didn't have an off-screen voice. We, we don't know Norma Jean's voice. Mm. And I feel like you can imitate someone's voice perfectly. You do the perfect accent. And there's no soul in it. There is no... There's no, you can't move people. So that was my goal, to move people. So to me, I, would have, I could have had two years of accent coaching to, to do her voice. As soon as they say action and I start acting, it's gone, forgotten. My brain, the other side of my brain takes over and the accent is just like, you know, gone. And that's how it should be. Because the important thing was the emotion. I'm proud of the result just because I do think uh, it, it feels real. And I think it's, it's, I think it moves people. And, you know, if you want to see Marilyn Monroe, then you, you should play one of her movies, not mm. this one. In this one, you're going to get something else. You're in every frame of every scene of this mm. entire movie. I was just thinking, my God, what a performance. But number two, how draining it must have been. Oh, yeah. Because. I was here for nine weeks, and I yeah. can tell you, <laughs> it, was, uh, it, it was exhausting. I just cannot imagine what it was like to be her mm. for 36 years. Playing Marilyn Monroe in a performance that already has critics talking about awards season, De Armas has come a long way from home. What were those early, as you were climbing up? I had an ambition and I had this desire and I had this idea of what I knew I could do. But sometimes, I mean, you do the best you can with what you're given. So you have to say yes to projects that you're, you're not really in love with, but you're building, you're building, you're building, you're building. Mm. And at some point you hope that you're tall enough to see, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, and, and I feel like that, that, that's what I've learned, you know? And um, I would have been way more patient and nicer to myself. But you know, who would have thought that Andrew thought of me because he saw Knock Knock? So you never know what someone else is gonna see in a job that maybe at the time wasn't, um, appreciated or understood or something, but if you do your job, at the end of the day, someone's gonna pay attention to that. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of not giving up and like struggle through the language and, and a new country and new people and just start from zero again. But it paid off and it's been incredible. Do you ever stop and think, my gosh, look how far I've come? from hitchhiking in Cuba to the drama school <laughs> yeah. to the heights I've reached now in Hollywood? Yeah, absolutely. I do stop sometimes, not very often. What does your family back in Cuba think about all this? They're very proud. They're very, very proud. You know, the other day, a classmate from my drama school, uh, he had posted this picture and he said something like, you know, remember Anna, we were all together studying and having dreams, now she's about to do the impossible. She's about to play Marilyn Monroe in this movie and we should all be so proud of her. It was really beautiful. It makes me proud to make them proud. 
Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. fans ready to unlock our true crime mysteries try dateline premium on apple podcasts you'll get early access to originals plus bonus content and everything is ad free so head to apple podcast now to subscribe hallie jackson now weekdays at five on nbc news now After more than two years at home with her family, Mila Kunis is venturing back into the world, though still clinging to some pandemic holdovers. I'm still in the habit of Instacarting. I'm actively trying to break. It's like going back into the grocery store. So there's a part of me that like loves this mask thing. The way we did a massive road trip over the summer, and the only reason we could have done it the way that we did it was because my husband and I were able to just wear masks when we went to like all the national park monuments and things. You loaded up the RV? Yes. Got the kids going? For three weeks. I don't know if we could have done it without a mask. It was great. Kunis is unmasked and back at work for her latest movie, the dark Netflix drama, Luckiest Girl Alive. Mr. Larson, it's me. Tiffany. The film is based on the 2015 New York Times bestseller by Jessica Knoll, who also adapted it for the screen. Had you read the book? Were you aware of the story? So it was sent to me as a script. The title seemed familiar. I realized that I'd read it five, six years prior. I just didn't remember reading it. And then I went, oh, I don't remember what the twists are. I knew that there were twists and things. And I was like, ooh, this will be a really fun read. And I remembered what I loved about it, which is all going back to Jessica No. I think the tone of it was um, different than all the other movies that I've seen when it came to, like, the mystery. The mystery lies in Kunis's character, Ani Finelli, a woman whose extreme, unresolved teenage trauma rushes back to the surface. She is a young woman living in New York City who's living the perfect Instagram life. So she's putting forward all of the things that she thinks that people want to hear and want to see, as probably most people can relate to. And so that's like a little bit of the fun cat and mouse game that she plays within herself, like which one of these is the real me. But I think it's a fun character to try to anticipate, which is what I think we were trying to do with the ending. Because we changed the ending from the book right. to the movie. Nobody believed me back then because I was a wet seal wearing gutter wrap. There's a lot of trauma in, in her mm -hmm. past yeah. that she has to confront that sort of defines her life and defines her yeah. future relationships. Do you like playing a, a character who's got all that depth? Yeah. Do I give you a real answer? I give you the answer that I think people want to hear. Now give me the real one. The real one is no. Like, it's all fun. Like, I really genuinely look at acting as play pretend. The other answer I can give you is yes, this was really hard for me and it was emotionally draining and I'm such a great actor. I, I can go on and on with the answer that I think I'm supposed to give, but the truth is, I love to play pretend. There's a part of you that at the end of the day is exhausted. But that being said, I can separate the two pretty well. So as hard as it is, I'm not in a ditch. I'm not in a mine. I'm not, I'm okay. Like it's not that hard. Some of the scenes are hard to watch. So I'm thinking this yes. must be hard for you, even if you're playing pretend, to act out. They have to be. The idea of a doing seems much harder than the actual technical nature of mm. it because it is broken down into so many different fragments. Rarely is it one long experience of that traumatic experience. So it, you feel like you're a little bit detached from experiencing the whole thing until you shoot the wide, call it. And then you have to experience the whole thing all at once. Mm. Some of this trauma is real to Jessica, to the author. And did that give us some added significance, taking care of her story in some way? Yeah. But what was interesting was the parts while we were shooting it, the parts that were triggering for her to be on set for were not the parts that you would have thought. Yeah. So it's not the obvious is my best way. Like, there's two very traumatic sequences in the film. Both of them were not the traumatic experiences that she was on, not, not on the set for. I'm curious how you decide what kind of project is worth this kind of investment. Clearly, this is a big investment of your time and effort. 
you got kids at home, you got a lot going on. Yeah. How do you choose, yes, that's the thing I want to do in this case? I look at it as, is this reason enough for me to not be home for dinner every night? What justifies that? The people involved. I think I, I really love working in a really fun environment, regardless of it being a comedy, drama, or thriller, or horror. I think the environment has to be right. The characters, and who's this movie for? Or who's this project for? And if I can't answer that, then there's no point of doing it. And there's such a range of it, too. You'll do something hilariously funny, yeah. something very you deeply serious. You want to entertain or ed you want to give a little spoonful of medicine with a whole bunch of sugar, or you just want to just give some sugar. Like, I'm at a place where I'm so, like, that's what I'm trying to find desperately right now is just an incredible comedy, like a great romantic comedy. I showed my 13-year-old son Ted for the first time oh, the other God. night. You're welcome. It was a revelation to him. Is it not amazing? It's amazing. I know. Ted was a wonderful, obnoxious movie. <laughs> <laughs> what, like, we, like that's what we need more of. Totally. Did also, he like so it? He loved it. He did? He's got a pretty sharp sense of humor. It's so And good. I think during COVID, all the rules of, like, language went out the window in terms of shows and movies and all that. By the way, same, that. except we have six and eight. And we were like, <laughs> you know what? It's just words. Go ahead. <laughs> we tried for a while. I don't know if you should watch that. And then we had two years to fill. So we're mm -hmm. like, forget it. Whatever you want. So yeah, same. It started for us movies. with um, F1. Oh, yeah. Because there's a lot of cursing on there that. Is. And I was like, meh, whatever. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? One of the, another long-term effect of, of COVID. Exactly. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> love you too. This is it. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good morning, Good morning. welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. A masked killer takes aim at fires. A fatal attraction that leads investigators to turn towards their own. Internal Affairs, a new podcast from Dateline. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Born in the former Soviet Union in modern-day Ukraine, Kunis and her family moved to the United States with just $250 when she was 7 years old, eventually settling in Los Angeles. We landed in L.A., it was something like February 17th and February 18th, I started school. Wow. So it was my, yeah, you, can't, you, you were just like thrown into it as quickly as you could. It's like dropping a kid on the moon saying, good luck. But we all dropped ourselves on the moon. Yeah. So it was like yeah. my parents were on the moon. I, we were all on the moon and we were like, just don't fall into that crater. Like, good luck. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine this year, Kunis and Kutcher rallied to raise more than $30 million for refugees from her home country. 
our collective effort will provide a softer landing for so many people as they forge ahead into their future of uncertainty. The world has watched and seen what Ukraine is about and how brave the people mm -hmm. are. And I, I imagine that's some source of pride to you and your family. It is. I mean, I never actually cared where I came from. It was always irrelevant. I, in fact, told people that I was Russian because when I left, it was 91, it just started the fall. Right. So I technically left when it was Russia. This war hits, and I was like, I am not Russian. <laughs> I am from Ukraine. <laughs> I have more pride now than I ever have about being from Ukraine. As a young girl suddenly moved halfway around the world, Kunis learned English by watching American TV and taking acting classes, which led to roles in commercials and on television. I feel like I caught up with the American culture very quickly at a very young age because I love television. Like, I love TV. I love watching television. Yeah. And I love watching TV when I was little because I didn't have it, and then I had it. And at seven, I was like, what is this box? <laughs> and uh, my parents were like, watch it. Yeah. So I watched a lot of TV growing up. Yeah, I mean, but to get into acting, right, to help yeah. with your confidence, I guess, and to learn some English. Yeah. And then it turns into Barbie commercials and Payless Shoes commercials mm -hmm. and all those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at what point... Baywatch. Let's not Bay forget Watch. Baywatch. That's a good... Yeah. I watched a great scene just this morning of you warning some young people of, a, I think, a brush Thank fire so on the much. way. If you got heat, don't get out of here. We're going to fry. I played two different characters on Baywatch. Wow. And they're just hoping nobody New noticed? Character. No one noticed. It was television <laughs> 30, 27 years ago. Yeah. Audiences started to notice Kunis when she landed God, the role of Jackie Burkhart Michael, on the Fox hit, That 70s Show. You are a dog, Michael, a dirty, dirty dog. So at what point was it like, oh, this is my career. This isn't just like a hobby I have as a teenager. This is what I'm doing. When I wanted to drop out of college. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. I would have to take a 6 a.m. class in order to be in the car uh. by 8 in order to sit on, on one of the freeways to get in, you know, to work on time and not get in trouble. And I was like, I can't do that. And so I was like, okay, what do I choose? Do I choose 70s or do I choose college? And I was like, mm, I'll choose 70s. It was there she so met Kutcher, though the friends and co-stars did not date until more than a decade later, marrying in 2015. In 2018, I asked Kunis about acting with Kutcher again. Probably not gonna no? happen. No, like, no, it's weird. But after some recent spousal negotiations. Do you really mean it? the pair decided to reprise their roles for an episode of the upcoming series, That 90s Show. Any hesitation or like, let's go do it? Honestly, there was a little hesitation. There was? From one of us. I will not say which one. We're gonna do one scene, we're gonna do together. We're, we're, spoiler alert, play a married couple in it. <laughs> I've never been more nervous in my life. Really? Than the day that we had to shoot that scene. Now why? Oh my God, because it's my husband. It was so, <laughs> weird to look at him and not be like, why are you doing that funny face? Or for him not to look at me and be like, why are you acting so Like, there's a part of you that after being, the, you can call BS on someone. Yeah. It's trippy because we were in the same house, like the, the, you know, stage, and it takes place in the same basement. But we're old and married and have children. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God. It was like being in Twilight Zone. It was very, very weird. But I'm so proud of it. By the way, 90s show is very cute. And Bonnie came back for it. So our original yeah. creators came back for it. It's really good. All speaking of your long, illustrious career, I can't believe you just started your 20th season on Family Guy. I know. 20 seasons. Yeah. Could you ever have dreamed when you stepped into the booth to be Meg the first time? No. Given the fact that we were canceled twice? <laughs> no. No, I did not presume that we were going to ever be on air ever again. We are so lucky. I mean, we are, I'm so lucky. By the way, speaking of COVID, all of it moved into my house. It was in the closet for the first year and a half. And then um, Ashton built me a little recording studio. So you really don't need to leave the house. I mean, you have this figured out. I mean, I, but I do need to leave the house. Like that's not, no, no, I'm leaving. I went out for drinks in New York yesterday. There you go. Yeah, that was exciting. Was, was it? It was really expensive. Oh, New York drinks things have gotten are, more expensive. Yeah, 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 it is. I was like, that's an that's a expensive uh, martini that I just had. What a gentleman. Well, I don't know whether I need to do a shot after this or kiss my wife. Ashton's training for the New York City Marathon. Having done this last year, I know that it puts some strain 
I'm the partner in the relationship. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for feeling my feelings with me. But okay, all jokes aside, it's been actually really great. Yeah. Lots of things with the running that I learned. Nipples. Oh, oh, the chafing. Yeah. So my husband, okay, I have an almost six year old and an almost eight year old. My husband goes to me after like three months of training or two, whatever it is, and goes, Hey babe, do you have, do you got any of that nipple cream from when you used to nurse? And I was like, used to nurse? I was like, we have big children. He goes, but do you have like any like nipple cream? And I went, no, I don't have random nipple cream laying around the house. Yeah, I kept it in case of an emergency. You never know when yeah. my nipples will chave. And you'll be there cheering them along? Yes. And then maybe you'll run a marathon. No. Never. Never. Okay. You nope. shut that down. Like, real don't quick. chase me because the likelihood of me running is slim to none. <laughs> like, I will just, I will be like, I'm sorry, you have me. Like, you win. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. It's so good to see you. Thank you. Good luck with the marathon. Congratulations on the movie. Dreyer filling in for Carson today here on Pop Start Plus. I'm so excited to bring you today's show. We've got Oscar winner Anne Hathaway, plus with Halloween almost here, a really interesting conversation with the actor who voiced Lucy in the beloved classic, It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. And we are going to round things out with a clip from our vault featuring the one and only Hugh Jackman. But first, Jacob Soboroff has today's Pop Start. A very special pop star correspondent this morning, one and only Molly Hunter joining us live with an update on the coronation of King Charles. Molly, hi, good morning. All the details, guys. Good morning to you. So for more than 900 years, coronations have happened right there at Westminster Abbey. Now, Queen Elizabeth had more than 8,000 guests in 1953. We're expecting something a little bit more scaled back for King Charles. With his reign already officially underway, a date has now been set for the symbolic start of the King Charles era. The palace announcing that his coronation will reflect the monarch's role today and look towards the future. The date, Saturday, May 6th, a departure from tradition. Queen Elizabeth's coronation was held on a weekday, a Tuesday back in 1953. The first televised coronation in history, and Charles, just four years old at the time, was among the thousands of guests watching his mother crown queen. Her presence will be strongly felt. Last month, Charles's first public address as king paid tribute to his beloved mother. Throughout her life, Her Majesty the Queen, my beloved mother, was an inspiration, an example to me and to all my family. The Archbishop of Canterbury will preside over the anointing, blessing, and consecration of King Charles, but there are likely to be a few changes. For example, Queen Elizabeth's coronation was nearly three hours long. Charles's expected to be smaller and simpler. Queen Elizabeth had some 8,000 guests inside the Abbey, but the capacity is only about 2,000, and guests may have a slightly more relaxed dress code compared to 70 years ago. Queen consort Camilla will also be crowned as part of the ceremony, reportedly wearing a crown created for the Queen Mother for the 1937 coronation of King George VI, featuring the famous 105-carat Corinor diamond. Now that is one heavy crown. Now no word yet on what roles King Charles's children or his siblings might play. Lots more details though, and we will get those straight to pop start, Jacob, when we get them. I'll send it back to you. <laughs> Molly Hunter with the details we have all been waiting for. Thank you so much, Molly. Coming up next, guys, Blake Shelton. We thought this day would never come, but get this, after 23 seasons, the country superstar is stepping away from the voice. So yesterday, Blake announced on social that next season will be Team Blake's final run. This is what he wrote. He said, the show has changed my life in every way for the better. It will always feel like home to me. I made lifelong bonds with Carson and every single one of my fellow coaches over the years, including my wife, Gwen <laughs> Stefani. Shelton's been with the series since it launched way back in 2011. He's the only coach to sit in one of those iconic spinning chairs for every single wow. season. And yesterday, by the way, The Voice also released the celebrity lineup who are going to join Blake oh. for season 23. Coming back. 
Kelly Clarkson, mm -hmm. along with newcomers Chance the Rapper oh. and Niall Horan. Okay. Cool. You know what I like? That Blake yeah. mentions Carson before Gwen. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it, it, it's just, it's just other uh, They're very close. I know yeah. they are. I know they are. Can't wait to see what Blake's got in store for his next chapter as well. Congratulations, Blake. Uh, next up, Duran mm -hmm. Duran. We know who is uh, going to love this next one, Miss Guthrie. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, get ready. After four decades of music, the Rock and Roll Hall of Famers are set to hit the big screen next month in a new documentary <laughs> concert <laughs> film. Okay, why are we look, at, look at that smooth. Because that's, 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 right. Right. that's your screen saver. That's that's why. Well, why is that? Really, uh, well, there we are. You're well, having a good time. Me and Simon Levine. It's called uh, a Hollywood High. It's going to have a series of new interviews there with the go. band, never before seen archival footage. It should have that picture of you oh, and, and him in the uh, in the dock. Epic performance filmed on a rooftop right outside one of the great buildings in LA, ah. the Capitol Records building. Here's a peek. Cool. We were staying on Sunset at a hotel that was then called the Hyatt. It was known as the Riot House. There was no decent music coming out of Los Angeles. We were really, really hot. Other entertainment news this morning. If you're a fan of Duran Duran, Duran Duran, Duran Duran has been honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Now to the reason we call this show Pop Start Plus. We have even more headlines for you. So let's start with MTV Cribs. Big news this morning for the show that became a cultural phenomenon in the 2000s, thanks to celebrity home tours like this one. It's so small that I let the kids jump on it. Go ahead, kids, jump on the small bed. My bed is 15 feet long, 30 feet wide. I want it to be the biggest bed in the world. And this is the bed that they made me. It's what he needs. Just MTV just dropped a teaser for a new season, which is set to premiere later this month. Plus, they revealed the lineup of celebrity guests whose doors they'll be knocking on, including Charo, Macy Gray, Leslie Jordan, and many, many more. Here's a peek. The original All Access Home Tour is back. It's Who's got their very own love lounge? Who's got a slick snake pad? Where them snakes sit? And who's got the craziest car collection? I hope you enjoy Looking forward to that. The new season of Cribs premieres October 27th on MTV. And finally, Charlie Puth. If you follow him on TikTok, you've probably seen how Charlie can create full songs out of random sounds he hears around the house. It's actually how he wrote his recent single, Light Switch. Well, last night on The Tonight Show, Charlie broke down the process for Jimmy step by step and was able to make an entire song using the clicking sound from a mug. Check this out. You record little That's it. There's the sound of the glass. But if you pitch it down, so that's just one note. So this is what that sounds like here. Ooh, we got reverb. Uh, too much. Wait. So I could, okay, so that's one layer, and I could add a little rhythm to it. Again, that's the cup sound. Okay, so that's looping. Again, these are all just cup sounds pitched down. If I put a kick drum, then you have a completed. Uh, it's awesome. It's like a master class in making music. What? Wow. I just wanted to. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Open your eyes, you get to decide. How's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day. Lighten your load every single morning. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. A masked killer takes aim and fires. A fatal attraction that leads investigators to turn towards their own. Internal Affairs, a new podcast from Dateline. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning. Welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. 
because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. Next album. Uh, so that's the latest for you today. Coming up, the lovely Anne Hathaway on her latest movie. Stay with us. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. In the new movie Armageddon Time, Anne Hathaway plays the mother of a Jewish family navigating Reagan-era New York. She stopped by Studio 1A to tell us what it was like to film. Anne Hathaway has proven over the years she really can do it all. She made us laugh while rising through the ranks of the fashion world and the Devil Wears Prada. And she showed off her singing skills and acting chops with her Oscar-winning turn in Les Mis. Well, now, in the upcoming drama Armageddon Time, Anne plays a mother in 1980s New York who is determined to get the best for her son. It might be an option for you and your family moving forward because he may be a bit slow. My son is not slow. No, sir. Mrs. Graff. No, I've heard enough. Get up. Time to go. Anne Hathaway, good morning. Good morning. What a meaty role for you to yes. sink your teeth into. Very this much. mother from 1980s Queens, New York. Mm. What drew you to this, this role? Oh, James Gray. The director. director, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I, I've been with uh, the people that I work with. I've worked with for a really long time. So my agent Josh called me up and he said I read something and I, I think you're going to love it. And I said, "Who's the director?" And he said, "It was James." And I, I, I had to remind myself that I should read the script before saying <laughs> yes. But that had you in hello. <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh, yeah, he had me at the immigrant. He he's an incredible director. And then when I found out what the script was about, how it's his personal story, it's based on his personal life, I thought, what an honor. What an honor to be someone, and, and, and I'm playing the character based on his mom. I was gonna ask about that. You know, the honor being honor, trusted. But yeah. also such a responsibility to, yeah. to play <laughs> his mother, a character he knows presumably and, better than anyone else. And, and you know it, you're a mom. You know that role is, it, it's so tender. It's so, it's so remarkable, and, and I know because I have a mother and I am a mother. It's so, it's so central to one's existence. So I found myself being um, not delicate, but just really sensitive when I was asking questions about his life and about what she was like, because you never want to presume uh, within a relationship like that. You never want to take up too much room, but I still had to get information because I had to play a character. So it was always a balance. It's such a personal story. It's, I mean, I feel like movies like this don't get made all that often anymore. Where it seems rare, right? Yes, and it's it's such a profound story. It's mm. deep. It's layered, but it's not a big action movie. I mean, you know, it, it's an opportunity for an, for an actress, like I said, to really sink your teeth into it. Well, it's a human story, yeah. and and we were playing people that we knew were real people, and so uh, being able to play something grounded, but also emotionally rich, dramatic, funny. That's the other thing about this family is they're funny. You know, and this is a, a story that doesn't shy away from showing some of the ugly sides of family. So we'll go from goofy to violent in a blink of an eye. And um, and it's a, it's a challenging film in that way. I heard you challenge your mom, your own mom, a little bit. At a little least bit. with the eye wear. Yes. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Brooklyn in the 80s. And so my mom was a mom in Brooklyn. I'm playing a mother in Queens. But uh, when they asked me what kind of eyeglasses my character wanted to wear, I knew exactly the ones. My mom wore these big tortoiseshell 80s uh, glasses. And we hunted and hunted and hunted. And and, and then we found them. They're amazing performances. As the young actors are incredible. Anthony Hopkins. First of all, I mean, okay, I you, mean. you've done a lot in your career. But I've been here very you are. lucky, yes. and, this, and that was a high, absolutely. So, I mean, what? How did you approach it? Like, was there kind of that intimidation factor? Oh yes, I, I tried not to be. I tried not to be, but my first day acting with him, I was non-functional. Like, completely. <laughs> when I say non-functional, I mean I couldn't. I couldn't get a line out. I had worked really hard at doing the oh. accent. Nothing came out. And like, you know, you're just jittery and nothing, nothing, nothing. And I've, I'm really lucky. Like I said before, I've worked with legends. And in the past, I would have gone home, beaten myself up, and that kind of would have been the job. But this time I thought, okay, it was a day. Shake it off. He's a legend. Anybody would trip in front of Anthony Hopkins. It's okay. Go back tomorrow and just be a person and mm. see what happens. And he's so lovely when you're just a person with him. Well, I heard you so kind of connected to the extent that now you're texting friends. Yes, we are. We do text. And he, I mean, I, <laughs> you like, met, text I mean, from Anthony Hopkins. They're beautiful. Is it like prose or is it emojis? I mean, what? it's a combination. <laughs> oh, I love that. 
<laughs> it's it's a little bit of both, but he's. Um, I hope this doesn't sound pretentious because I do mean it sincerely and literally. He's an illuminated soul, mm. and he's so generous with his perspective and his life experiences. And so I, I obviously, how could you not learn so much from him just as an actor? But I just learned from how to, just about being a person, just being a human being in this world and in this business. And it was it was a joy and a gift. Oh, it's wonderful. I mean, let's just text him after. Let's send okay, him a selfie. No problem. Cause, just because you can't. Finally, I have to ask you about Fashion Week. Okay. Everyone was so excited because we have to show the picture. Here you are next to Anna Winter, who famously was the inspiration for the Devil Wears Prada. You're looking like your character, Annie. Was this on purpose? <laughs> was this by just design? How did this happen? Look at you. I know. that it, it was kind of nuts, wasn't it? It was by accident. I was supposed <laughs> to wear something else. The shoes didn't fit. This was the other outfit that came. And then uh, my hairstylist, who was so lovely, and I'd never worked with him before, just said, oh, I know what to do. And he threw my hair up in a ponytail. And I looked in the mirror, and I thought, oh, that's funny. I wonder if anybody will notice. <laughs> We they noticed. noticed. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, you look good. I Thank love it. Thank you very it. much. And before we go, Savannah, I just have to say, my uh, cousin, who's like my sister, her son Noah is your number one fan. Oh. So I have to take this opportunity to just say hi, Noah, and let you know. That, that is so sweet. And hi, Noah. I mean, wow, what an honor. Thank you so much. Noah, I love it. I'll send him a video, <laughs> and then we'll text Anthony Hopkins. We're, we have a lot to so do. So much to do during the commercial break. So much to break. do. We got to get this going. Check out Armageddon Time, a beautiful and stunning movie from our sister company, Focus Features. It opens in select theaters on October 28th and nationwide on November 4th. We should mention Armageddon Time hits theaters on October 28th. Coming up, we are looking back at a Halloween classic. It's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, with the voice of Lucy. Today's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. your eyes, you get to decide. How's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day. Lighten your load every single morning. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about, and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You're back here with us on Pop Start Plus. Sally Dreyer was just eight years old when she was tapped as the voice of Lucy Van Pelt in It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. She shared memories of recording the beloved 1966 special and told us what it was like to work with Charles Schultz. Take a look. Voicing Lucy meant I could yell and get away with it. You blockhead, you're gonna miss all the fun just like last year. You blockhead. <laughs> poison dog lips is a good one too. Blech, ech, poison dog lips. Ugh, poison dog lips. Because I work with animals, so I know that dog lips aren't poison. I would describe Lucy as a brilliant, sarcastic character that we could all aspire to be like. 
My sister worked for Lee Mendelson, the producer at the time. I was eight years old. He had been pitching to Charles Schultz for years. I want to do a special. I want, they were friends. I want to do a special. I want to do a special. No, 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 no. Well, Charles Schultz called him one day and said, I have an idea, but I only want to use real kids for the voices. So my sister was sent with a reel to reel tape recording thing to all the grammar schools in the area. And at the end of a couple of long days, uh, she sat me down at the kitchen table before dinner and said, I might as well try you. So that's how I was selected for Violet. However, after that, Charles Schultz decided I had a particular quality of crabbiness in my voice that, and I was elevated <laughs> to the role of Lucy. Say, Charlie Brown, I've got a football. So when we went to record, um, what it meant was, at the time, because I was eight, it meant a day away from school. So I got to get out of school and my sister uh, generally, or another uh, production assistant who worked for Lee Mendelssohn would pilot all the voices in a car and drive us to San Francisco. We would go up into the recording studio and they would take us in one at a time to, to do our lines. However long that took, the rest of us would be riding the elevators and, you know, basically quite rowdy without any supervision. <laughs> we were all kind of close for the day, but we came from different schools. So then we'd separate. Then the next time we recorded, we would we would have a great reunion. We were a wild bunch of kids that rode our bicycles until dusk every night during the summer, especially. So all the neighbors said, oh, God, we'd know that voice anywhere. I guess I was loud everywhere I went. Charlie Brown, if you got an invitation, it was a mistake. Charles Schultz said at one point that all the characters were him. I would say my recollection of him is as though he's a little like Charlie Brown, but apparently he had a Lucy side as well. I rarely saw him, but we did meet on occasion when Lee Mendelssohn would want to do a special or do a photo op or something like that, and we'd all pile in the car again <laughs> and drive to Santa Rosa. I remember his demeanor was so sweet and quiet, and I got to stand next to him at his drafting table, and I vividly remember standing there and him telling me that he was working on a strip and I remember him telling me it's like doing a term paper every day and, and that's the genius of him is because every every strip has such deep meaning if you peel the, the layers off. A person should always choose a costume which is in direct contrast to her own personality. That was a dilemma that they had is because we all got fired when we hit 12 when our voices changed. So they had to seek out a whole new cast. Um, and, it, and it was important for them to find kids that sounded the same. So they really dug themselves a hole because that was a difficult thing. But, but I, I think true to now, even that last animated special um, that was, I don't know how many years, it's been five years or so, those kids sound like we did. And it's kind of amazing. <laughs> I think the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown is most beloved because of Snoopy. What in the world kind of costume is that? He's just everybody's dog. You know, everybody loves their dog and, and knows their character and knows, but, but Snoopy is this, this human yet canine wonder. I mean, it's a long way to Tipperary. He's rising up out of the pumpkin patch. That's the pivotal point in that show that really is so endearing. And then good old Lucy going to pick out her brother freezing to death in the pumpkin patch the day after Halloween because Lucy really does have a heart for her stupid little brother. Yeah, if you ask people around me, you, I, I would definitely say they think I'm Lucy. I live in a little town of 400 people and... Uh, I'm kind of bossy with the whole town. Lucy would have grown up to be a volunteer vet tech, a, a sculptor, picture framer, and a store owner. <laughs> My partner and I live in Jerome, Arizona, and we have uh, the largest kaleidoscope gallery in the world. And so mostly American made kaleidoscopes and art glass, kind of the uh, the gears of the place. It's called Nellie Bly, kaleidoscopes and art glass. I got a popcorn ball. I got a fetch 
fun. I got a pack of gum. I got a rock. Being part of this phenomenon, I don't identify with it personally now, other than I played that role as a child. Who would have thunk <laughs> that it would be so synonymous with the 60s and on memories of the 60s for people my age? So cool. There's so much in that conversation about Peanuts and its creator that I just never knew. Up next, a flashback with Hugh Jackman chatting about his iconic role as Wolverine. It feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I wave. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. Hugh Jackman has been a favorite around here for a very long time. So we thought today, on his birthday, we'd look back on his visit here in 2000 when he was knee-deep in playing Wolverine. Okay, everyone, the mutants have taken over the box office, that is. This weekend, X-Men, the movie based on the wildly, po wildly popular comic book series about mutant superheroes, toppled Scary Movie and The Perfect Storm, taking in more than $57 million. Hugh Jackman plays the lead character, Wolverine. You're in my school for the gifted, for mutants. You'll be safe here from Magneto. What's a Magneto? A very powerful mutant who believes that a war is brewing between mutants and the rest of humanity. I've been following his activities for some time. The man who attacked you is an associate of his called Sabretooth. Sabretooth? Storm. What do they call you? Wheels? <laughs> this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. The Cyclops, right? <laughs> Get out of my way. And a clean shaven Hugh Jackman is here. Hi, no Hugh. Claws. Nice I to can see guarantee you. No clothes. Thank you. Good, good to see you too. Good morning and congratulations on Thank the you. tremendous showing at the box office. Were you surprised? Yeah, I think we're all surprised. Uh, I did a film in Australia a little while ago when it was released, and about a month after it was released, I got sent a bottle of champagne. They said, fantastic, great news. And on the note, it said, we've just hit $1 million in the box office. So, <laughs> So this like, is a big change of pace, huh? Well, the first, I got a call on Saturday morning say, you will never believe it. We've made 20 million in one day. And I was like, I've been like this all weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, so, you, you didn't really know, like Anna Paquin, uh, I spoke with Anna on Friday, you weren't that familiar with this whole cult of the X-Men. It is huge. I had no idea. I didn't grow up reading the comic. Uh, I, I was aware of an Australian rock band called the Uncanny X-Men, but that was about it. Uh, and so when I got involved with the project, I sort of started cramming. And I was every morning in the makeup trailer, I'd be reading, 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 reading. And of course, now I'm a fan. You know, so, what, so what's the appeal, you think? It's, a, it's more layered. It's the thinking person's comic. And that's how it was sort of billed and known when it was first out there. I mean, the people who read X-Men are still reading it when they're 40. Believe me, I've met many of them. I mean, oh. they are, they're fanatics, and in fact, oh, some yeah. of them were not very excited, frankly, Hugh, when you were cast in this role. I know that you, <laughs> you have a website, and you got a lot of not very complimentary 
comments. <laughs> Vitriol. I mean, is what they I were like, yes. this guy stars in musicals. He played Curly in Oklahoma. Yes. He was in Beauty and the Beast. What the heck is he doing as Wolverine, right? It kind of, I, I was expecting that. I mean, uh, in a way, it's a blessing because no one knows who you are. So the main reaction was, who is this guy, you know? Um, so they had to wait to the movie to find out. Thank goodness the fans are behind it. But uh, I'm actually pretty thin-skinned. I didn't even look at them. But uh, people I met said, oh, you should have seen what they wrote about you this morning. You know, how do you even go out of the house in the day? You know, it was uh, vitriol is exactly how I like to describe it. So your background is primarily, I know you've done some TV work and mm -hmm. that, that big uh, moneymaker movie that you did, <laughs> $1 million. Exactly. But primarily it's stage work. Yeah, I've done a lot of stage work. Can um, you sing like, oh, what a beautiful morning for us? Uh, this morning? Yeah. Let's go to the tape. No. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. Look at your face. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's the good. The corn is as high as an elephant's eye. And it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. That'll do it. That was very good, Hugh. Thank you. How cool is that? And I think 22 years later, he's still portraying Wolverine. Happy birthday to you, Hugh. Well, that's going to do it for today's Popstar Plus. And again, we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. The hills are alive with the sights and smells and tastes. Ah, come on, it's a food show. Now, nothing says autumn quite like apple. Whether it's a trip to an orchard like this, a warm slice of apple pie, or cheering with cider. But when did apples become the apple of America's eye? I left the Big Apple, and I'm here in Massachusetts, where America's history with apples actually began. So today, we are going to get to the core of how apples became a homegrown hero. How do you like them apples? Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. My family and I have been coming here to Hilltop Orchards in Massachusetts for the past 20 years. That's right. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better fall family activity than apple picking, and especially the apple cider donuts. And of course, what also pairs well with a trip to orchards? Cider. And they make a lot of it here at Hilltop. Oh, and did I mention the donuts? Meet David and Sarah Martell, high school sweethearts who reconnected in their 30s. Together, they run Hilltop Orchards. We're definitely an apple orchard, but we're also a winery and a cidery, so we're a triple threat. Today, David handles the operations of the orchard, cidery, and winery, with Sarah focusing on guest experience. The orchard's historic cider mill, where David played as a kid, was renovated in 1997. Now, they call it home. I started coming to this orchard when I was about six years old. My father worked here then. David left the Berkshires and worked in construction for several years. When he decided to return home, he really went back to his roots taking a part-time job at Hilltop. I've been in the orchard business for about 12 years now. David's the third generation in his family to work on the 100-something-year-old orchard. Did you ever think that you would be running the orchard someday? Nah, in a million years. I quickly fell in love with these apple trees and decided that's what I'm going to do, diving in and learning about all the different apples and the history of apples. And that history is pretty sweet. I like to think of myself as an apple nerd. <laughs>
My name is Amy Traverso and I'm the senior food editor at Yankee Magazine and the author of the Apple Lover's Cookbook. Crab apples are the only variety indigenous to North America. Sweet apples were introduced to America by early colonists in the 1600s. Sweet apples have their origins in this area of Western China, sort of the border between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, called the Tian Shan Mountain Range. Those apple seeds came over with the Jamestown Expedition, and trees were planted at Plymouth. But in the early days, colonists weren't making pies and tarts. Most apples grown in America at that time were more likely to be turned into cider than eaten. Apples played a very important role when there was people coming from England. As they say on the boat, they would make hard cider because that cider would last where water might spoil and someone would get sick. This trend continued stateside. By 1775, 10% of all New England farms had a cider mill. Today, I am at B.F. Clyde Cider Mill in Old Mystic, Connecticut. Meet Amy Harrison and her daughter, Sarah Monk, fifth and sixth generation owners of Clyde's. We're the last original steam-powered cider mill in the United States. Back in, you know, the 1800s, early 1900s, everybody had a cider mill that had a farm. We use the same press, it's the same mill, and not many people get to go to work and put their hands on a lever and say, you know what, my great-great-grandfather did this same thing back in 1898. Cider was really important to early America because it was relatively easy to make. People had apples in abundance. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams famously loved it, drank it every day. Children drank it because it was low in alcohol, but it was often safer than water. Water could often be contaminated at that time. These days, Americans don't drink as much cider as the founding fathers. Two things happened to kind of bring the apple to its knees. We had immigration from Germany and Czechoslovakia, which were beer growing regions. Beer took over as the major American drink. Another reason behind cider's decline? Prohibition. Apples were very strongly associated with cider at the time. They were really seen as a source of alcohol. My great-great-grandmother was arrested twice, never convicted but arrested twice for um, bootlegging. In the 1930s, Apple's sinful image was reborn as shipping methods improved. Sweet apples from Washington State could be transported all over the country, and the industry grew. Apples then had to be remarketed as just a dessert thing, as something you bake with or eat fresh from your hand. And so apples, they went through this rebranding and emerged as this sort of innocent, sweet fruit that wasn't going to get you drunk or do anything naughty. It was just going to make a nice pie. <laughs> now, even hard cider is making a comeback, due in large part to the craft beer boom in the late aughts. Gluten's having a moment, so people are shying away from a lot of beers. Cider is fermented apples. And that's it, where a lot of other beverages or mixed drinks or anything of that nature could have a lot of preservatives and different things added to them. Today, Americans are drinking 10 times more cider than a decade ago. And that's meant big business for Hilltop. Most of our guests are cider enthusiasts that are relatively new to the cider craze. Hilltop making around 1,500 gallons daily. And I got a chance to give it a try or a press. They say time to make the donuts, it's time to make the cider. So here's some gloves. I see okay. you brought your boots. Yeah, I did. The process starts with freshly picked apples that are washed thoroughly. Next up, culling. As Benjamin Franklin once said, the rotten apple spoils his companion. They're sorting through what's coming down the conveyor. This apple has some dings and bumps. The good apples are sent to the grinding wheel. And they will get ground up to an applesauce consistency. Now it's my turn to prepare the ground apples for pressing. So it's like an apple sludge diaper. That's it. Then the apples get pressed down to the last drop. That's 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Up until this point, the process for sweet and hard cider is the same. Excellent. And nobody got hurt. Sweet cider would be bottled at this stage. For hard cider, the fermentation process begins. 
So sweet cider becomes more popular once we can refrigerate apple juice to prevent it from fermenting. In the mid 20th century, cider stands and apple picking became an American pastime, a tradition my family's enjoyed for more than 20 years each fall. in our changing world. Download the NBC News app. our true crime mysteries try dateline premium on apple podcasts you'll get early access to originals plus bonus content and everything is ad free so head to apple podcast now to subscribe now tonight with joshua johnson streaming weeknights at eight on nbc news now Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. There's just something about apple picking that inspires my best dad jokes. What apple sayings have you heard? There's a lot of um, insider sayings. <laughs> okay, I, I got one for you. Okay. okay. They say the family that plays together stays together. The family that picks together sticks together. There you go. As far as my kids are concerned, my jokes are as much a part of our annual tradition as the apples themselves. It's like, oh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> my family's been coming to Hilltop for more than 20 years, even before my two youngest were born. I don't know if it's something about the season when apples ripen and it's starting to get cooler and you're thinking about like comforts of home and coziness. People have very intense emotional connections with apples. Agritourism in the United States started becoming popular during the Industrial Revolution, when city dwellers looked to nature for recreation. Labor shortages during and after World War II saw farmers calling for volunteers to help pick crops. By the 1960s, enterprising farmers recognized America's love for apples. In the fall, the you pick tradition became a profitable pastime at orchards all across the country. Is there a right way or and a wrong way to pick an apple? Spoiler alert, there is a wrong way. The problem with twisting and pulling the apple is that if it is not ripe, you're going to also get next year's apple. Can you show me? I can. So this is an apple that I know is not ready to pick yet. Okay. So if we were to lift up on this, uh -huh. if it was ripe, it would come free. Right. So it did not come free. Okay, right next to it is some Macintosh apples. Okay. And if you go ahead and lift up on one at a kind of a, at an angle into the sky, it comes it comes Just free. Like that. So that means that it's ripe. Okay, and the other thing is, well, that's the worst thing you can do when oh. you're picking an apple. <laughs> so we we treat these like eggs and oh, we place them in place the bucket. Them in the bucket. There's sometimes little brown spots on them. That's from fingers. Oh. So the worst thing that you can do to somebody with a farm stand or, or a fruit grower is grab their apples and start squeezing them. I do like the Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp yeah. it is. I was gala, but uh, okay. I've moved to the Honeycrisp. With an empty nest, I thought this year's Roker family trip was gonna look pretty different. But then I heard from my boy at college. Nick was very adamant about Okay, are you going to come pick me up so I can go apple picking? Because I thought, this will be the first year we don't have anybody to apple pick with. Right. Much to my delight, the family that picks together does stick together. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. 
You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. I love you too. <laughs> These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. I love you too. <laughs> mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. I love you too. <laughs> Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. I only have pies for you. American Pie is certainly an American icon. And in Southern California, one local family's pies have achieved all American status. And this holiday season, they're gearing up to make over 50,000 of these each week. I love apple pie. I, every time I eat apple pie, I think, man, my mom just hit it out of the park. I'm Dave Smothers. I'm Tim Smothers. And our mother started the Julian Pie Company in 1986. From a young age, Liz Smothers developed a passion and a knack for baking. She often tells a story of standing on a milk crate next to her mom. I was probably four or five years old. I would crawl up on a box and take the little leftover pieces of dough and put them in a jar lid. I would put the little apple in my jar lid and cover it. and She would bake it in the oven just along with hers and I would eat it. I would say that if I had not had that experience, I would never be in the pie business. In the early 80s, the Smothers family moved to Julian, California, a picturesque mountain town near San Diego. Funds were tight, so my mom uh, ended up taking odd jobs. When we moved here, I had to go to work. The only place that a job was available was in a bakery. And uh, I, I tell you, after I started working with pie making, that old love just came right back. That love was mutual. Liz's pies were in high demand at the local bakeries where she worked, quickly gaining a loyal following. She had built up a reputation. There were stories that they would go in and go, well, I want one of her pies and point at my mom. A historic gold mining town, Julian thrives thanks to agriculture, namely its award-winning apples. So once we came out here to Julian, and uh, she saw the opportunity. She just never looked back. Wild horses couldn't have stopped me. Honestly, I was not thinking of how much money can I make. I just was dying to make a, a good pie like my mother made. Two years after moving to Julian, Liz opened her own shop, the Julian Pie Company. She was 50 years old. Prove it. It's never too late to embark on a dream. My mom baked 120 pies, and she sold out the first day. It was a, it was a great grand opening. In this shop, there's an apple pie for everyone. It's the apple crunch with vanilla ice cream. It's not too sweet and it's really fresh. This is the most amazing pie I have ever had in my life. From cherry apple to apple rhubarb, today, Julian has 15 unique apple pie varieties in rotation. Thank you so much. The most popular seller is the Dutch apple. My mom's kind of joke was that that's the pie that pays our rent. Today, the busy bakers here make up to 10,000 pies a day. Pie production beginning around 3 a.m. 
it's no surprise that fall is their busiest season. Thanksgiving's the Super Bowl, and, uh, and Christmas is like uh, another Super Bowl. The pies are primarily made by hand, starting off with four ingredients. Pie crust is just flour, water, shortening, salt. That's it. It's the way you handle the dough, so you get a nice short bread crust rather than a chewy crust. The brothers say their mom had a gift for knowing just when to stop kneading to make it perfect. If you don't get the dough right, you might as well not have the business. Miguel's worked with my mom. He knows exactly the precise measurements of how to do things. We add a few hundred pounds of flour, very ice cold water. The twin arm mixer blends the dough. That's what I think of his grandma's hand. The 400 pound batch of dough heads to the extruder where it's cut into individual portions. So a 9.2 ounce puck falls into a pie shell, smashes the dough into a perfect shape, then they go into our freezers and we use them as needed. Next up, assembling the pies. Apples are peeled, sliced, then spiced. Cinnamon, sugar, and salt. This is all my mom's original recipe. There'll be a little bit of butter. Every time that dumps, I just get giddy. I'm like, yes, we hit it out of the park. So these pies have all been packed. They're nice and round, kind of like a mushroom. Patty's going to begin lifting, which is separating the, uh, the, the crust from the pie tin. If you don't do this step right here, that pie will bubble over in the oven. My mom was a queen fluter. The pies are brushed with an apple cider egg wash before baking. Then they're cooled, boxed, and ready to be shipped. Julian's pies are sold in hundreds of stores, including big grocery chains like Albertsons, as well as mom and pop shops throughout San Diego. My name's Sierra Smothers. I'm Liz Smothers' granddaughter. I grew up baking pies with my grandma. This job was actually my first job in high school. These days, Sierra pitches in wherever she's needed, including driving the delivery truck. I said, Sierra, do you want to spend the day with your dad and help me deliver pies? And she, of course, jumped at the opportunity. So we had a whole day together delivering pies. Everybody loved it. <laughs> Julian now has two locations, employing almost 70 people. So many admire their company's founder. It's the best boss. No, everything I do is very, how would Liz want it, want it done? Liz's perfectionism and attention to detail is really what's brought this company to the magnitude that it is. And if we don't carry that on, then what are we doing? <laughs> Liz passed away peacefully, surrounded by family in May but her legacy lives on through the beloved recipes her family works hard to preserve. I just hope that she's looking down and whatever that we do, we, we have her in our hearts and uh, that she's proud. Oh, this is where you get choked up. <laughs> now it's very, uh, it's very special. I really miss her. Um, she left a, a huge legacy with big shoes to fill. As for the future of Julian, the Smothers continue to welcome customers old and new with open arms. Come again, sweetie pie. That's my mom. Coming up next, a North Carolina family is giving candy apples a glow up with their colorful and creative creations. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. A masked killer takes aim and fires. A fatal attraction that leads investigators to turn towards their own. Internal Affairs, a new podcast from Dateline. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Good morning, welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We need to pull up one extra chair at the table. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day, we start our morning so you can take on yours. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. 
do you make apples even sweeter? Well, you dip them in candy, of course. Candy apples have long been associated with boardwalks and state fairs, but there's one entrepreneur in North Carolina who's taking this traditional treat to a whole new level with a colorful twist on the classic coating. My name is Kim Battle, and this is my husband, Travis Battle, and we are the owners of Candy, Candy Apples, Apples by K. K. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank y'all. I would describe Candy Apples by K as the world's first hard candy candy apple shop. We specialize in the hard candy apple that started out with the traditional carnival treat, and then we've expanded that to different colors, different flavors. According to most historians, American-style candy apples were invented in New Jersey in the early 1900s. They're known for that signature cinnamon-flavored red shell until now. I like the uh, tropical punch. My favorite flavor is turtle. I would certainly say that the variety makes them special. For Kim and Travis, this treat has an especially sweet history. Candy apples have always been a favorite. My husband used to bring them to me when we were dating. And then when I threw his surprise 40th birthday party, I wanted him to have gold candy apples as a favor. We found someone to make them. And then she encouraged me, you know, you can make these yourself. You could do this yourself. Wanting to enjoy candy apples year round, Kim began developing unique candy recipes at home. Her kids, her first taste testers. Eventually, it picked up and neighbors and friends would say, oh, I would buy some from, from you if you have some. And I thought, let me start an Instagram page and see how many people are interested in candy apples. At this point, I'm working full time still uh, as an accountant. And on the weekends, I would start doing markets to offer these candy apples. When Kim got laid off, she saw an opportunity to pursue her dream full time. There's never been a storefront that just focused on candy apples and you, love going in a cupcake shop and you're like, ooh, all the flavors and the beauty of having the case displayed of all these treats. And I thought that would be so yum to have the same thing, but just in Candy Apples. Candy Apples by K officially opened in April, 2019. A line of eager patrons stretched down the sidewalk on opening day. Any dream of hers, I'm definitely gonna support it. It's gonna become my dream as well. So we took off with it. Today, Kim and her team make over 40 different flavors and rotate their offerings each week. The process starts, of course, with fresh apples that Travis picks up from local farmers markets each weekend. Those are pretty. In our opinion, the Granny Smith apple is the best apple to use. That tart, hard, crisp apple is perfect against sweet candy. The apples are washed thoroughly in vinegar and hot water to remove that waxy coating and it creates a smooth surface for the candy to be applied to. In the candy apple world, this is a dirty apple and this is a clean apple. The apples need to dry for 24 hours or else the candy coating won't stick properly. And this might just be my opinion, but the more I've dipped, I feel like covering the apple all the way to the stick is ideal for presentation. Kim's candy starts with a base of sugar, corn syrup, and water heated to 300 degrees. Then flavor extracts are added. She's experimented with dozens over the years, including blue raspberry, sour watermelon, and pina colada. And while we couldn't get her to divulge exactly how she gets those eye-popping colors, Kim did reveal one secret. Making sure that you're using bright colors and that your candy is not transparent would also be a key to making sure that you have a beautiful apple. Many apples get a little extra love with candy pieces or nuts. The store now offering a variety of dipped treats, including candied grapes and chocolate dipped fruit. But the classics are always on standby. Our family favorites are definitely still the carnival. The turtle, which is caramel, milk chocolate, and pecans, is also a huge favorite. It's one that we can slice and share with everyone. And they really do mean everyone. We have five kids ranging uh, ages 2 to 22. They all contribute something different even to the family business and they're very familiar with candy apples. They're so used to seeing them that I think the five-year-old's first word was apple. It was apple. <laughs> Elena, the couple's oldest, works at the shop. She also handles their social media to help boost business. This is carrot cake. 
I feel it's really brought her out of her shell. I mean, she was an introvert and very quiet, but this has really blossomed her into being a lot more outgoing and engaging in conversation with customers. The younger kids continue to taste test while Travis pitches in where needed. He works full time, but still in the evenings at night, he's washing apples, he's stocking the store, he's getting all our supplies. I think often like, I don't think I could have done this with anybody else but him. Kim owing a large part of her success to a generation that came before. Our moms played a huge role as well. Travis's mom was so precise in developing a process and a lot of the ways that we dip and a lot of our little tricks and secrets came from, from her. And then my mom working the store, um, she was actually washing apples as well. She's grateful they were able to enjoy her success early on. Last year, last April, uh, my mother-in-law passed away and after losing her, that was very traumatic and hurtful for our family. She was the matriarch of the family. And so two weeks later, my mom passed and we weren't expecting that of, you know, either situation. We are definitely keeping them a daily part of our lives, remembering everything that they've taught us and instilled in us, um, knowing how uh, tickled they were about how far the business had come. I don't think there's a day that goes by that we don't talk about them or think about them. A lot of times when we're doing things, we can kind of feel their peaceful spirit with us and encouraging us and pushing us. And without that, I don't know that we could continue, you know. And just like their mothers, Kim and Travis are passing down many lessons to their children. I believe some of the things that the kids have learned by watching Kim run the business is resilience, patience, love and passion. You know, a great job managing both. Apples are a true American icon. At their core, they're a shining example of innovation and versatility, and their place in U.S. history is one of patriotism and pride. But most of all, they foster a sense of togetherness. shop all day contributor chassis post and each week i'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in style finder i'm shop all day contributor makon jovu and i'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media in influencer trends and i'm lifestyle expert and founder of psi made this erica damasek i'm here with products and projects you can buy to diy and the best part is anyone can do it this is Shop All Day, Fall Harvest. Hi, I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and we're back today with another episode of Shop All Day. And today, we are bringing you all things fall to get you in the autumn mood. Think apple picking, tailgates, and cooler weather with even cooler style. From knit sets that are machine washable, yes, knit is a big trend you'll be seeing, to a midi dress that screams fall for under $35. And we don't just stop at fashion. We have accessories too, from jewelry trims to fall footwear. Not to mention sweet treats you can make yourself with the apples you pick. And remember, see that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. So let's get to it. First, let's talk about a big trend for fall, all things knit. I fell in love with this cozy knit sweater and lounge pants set from The Drop, which is Amazon's fashion forward private label. And I'm a huge fan of sets in general because they're fashion no brainers. I mean, you can wear them together and look instantly pulled together or split them up and mix them in with your entire wardrobe. So first, Let's talk about the sweater. It is a super plush and soft crew neck pullover style. I mean, check out these bell sleeves and it even has a slit back vent. And I love this cuddle chic rib texture. It's got a loose silhouette that also makes a fab layering piece. And I also like the length. I mean, it hits just below the hip, which is really flattering. Wear it with your leggings, jeans, skirts, truly anything or 
go for the set like I did and pair with the matching knit pants, which I must say are among the most comfortable I've worn in a long time. Now on to one of my ultimate fall go-tos, the midi dress. When in doubt, I reach for a great midi again and again. It never lets me down. In fact, I have a few that I keep in constant rotation. So I am thrilled to share with you this incredibly stylish and affordable find in my favorite print ever, Leopard. Look how fantastic this midi is. It's got a great wrap style top with a little snap to make sure that it keeps closed and an elastic waistband, thank you very much. And a super flattering tiered A-line silhouette. And of course, that perfect midi length. And how about these two autumnal takes on the leopard print? You can choose between these little fabulous tiny micro leopard print and a larger leopard spot print. I'll take them both. And this is another closet essential that will take you absolutely everywhere. Wear with tall boots or booties or dress down with sneakers or flats. Next, I am a huge fan of this multitasker, the turtleneck bodysuit. Can't you tell? <laughs> and I'm not alone. It's a bestseller with over 35,000 ratings and for good reason. You can pair it with virtually everything in your closet. Now, here's what makes this one so great. It's like an elevated take on the classic turtleneck. It gives a smooth line, no constant tucking your shirt in all the time, which I love. I find it to be such an easy to wear cut. And I am also a big fan of this you know, really easy stretch fabric. And when I say it's versatile, I'm not kidding. Wear it with absolutely everything. Jeans, a cute pleated midi skirt, trousers, and it's also perfect for layering. And you can choose from sizes extra small to XXL. Now for the ultimate fall accessory that just screams fall vibes. The wide brim cowboy hat. I mean, how great would this hat look with our midi dress, by the way, or pretty much everything we've got with us today. You'll see this hat all over social media as the must have instant outfit maker. And these amazing takes are from Forever 21 and they're under $20, but I think they look so much more expensive. And they're made with this really nice felt-like material and they've got an elongated brim and that is what is so key to the trend. And they've also got this great dimpled crown and it's sort of dimpled here on the sides that gives it that great Western cowboy feel that's so hot this season. And they're finished with a really pretty velvet ribbon. Can you see that? I think that's so, so great. And you can choose from eight different colors. And lastly, a bucket bag, which is having quite the moment this fall. Yes, we got another high style, low price fall accessory that you're gonna wanna add to your cart ASAP. So meet Bifo Leather Bucket Tote. And can you believe that this bag is under $30. I mean, I love the way the silhouette looks, but I also love how much room this style affords. I mean, look, there's plenty of space for everything you need to carry. Of course, your wallet and essentials, but also it fits your laptop, notebooks, water bottle, gym clothes, and more. And I love this thicker width strap with the silver and gold slide bolt hardware. It's really got this equestrian vibe. And how great, honestly, does this look on the shoulder? It's kind of like the perfect length. And it also comes, check this out, with a matching smaller pouch that you can use for organizing or you can wear it as a crossbody. I mean, it comes with its own thin strap, which you can also use with the tote. You can see here, we switched out the strap from the thicker one to the thinner one. And I also like this outsized pocket detail, right? And the color selection in all the fall classics. And though this bag is absolutely fabulous for fall, the bag also works year round. So let's run through all the products one more time. We've got the knit sweater and pants set, the fall midi dress, the mock turtleneck bodysuit, 
the Forever 21 cowboy hat, and the leather bucket tote. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. That's it for Style Finder. Up next, Mako and Lovu is talking to star jewelry designer, Stephanie Gottlieb. She'll show us her fall favorites from her signature hoops to affordable fall footwear. And later, Erica Dongsek shows us how to make caramel apples with the bounty that you pick. So stay with us. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day, lighten your load, every single morning. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful so life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love ride. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Um, yeah, I love that too. <laughs> Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Um, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hi there, welcome back. I'm Makon Dovu and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. And don't forget the QR code on the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. Stephanie Gottlieb has her own fine jewelry line, including rings, necklaces, and more. Plus, you might have seen her statement hoops brightening up social media. We're so excited to chat with her. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Oh, I'm so excited that you're here. Let's take a step back. Let's talk about your background. How did you get started designing jewelry? Did you always know that you wanted to make a career out of it? So I have always loved jewelry and accessories in general, but this is not necessarily where I saw myself ending up. When I graduated from college, I took an internship at a diamond company and I ended up staying at that company for five years. And then I just wanted to try something on my own. And so I did. And now almost 10 years later, this baby has turned into something so different than I ever imagined it would be. But it's been such an incredible journey. I love the way you connect with your following on social media. You have a very engaged audience. If you were to give advice to anyone who wants to have that sort of same kind of relationship with their audience, what would you say to them? I think it's so much about building community and being able to offer something to your audience. So is there advice or education that you can provide so that they feel like they're really getting something out of that relationship with you? Yeah, education, but also I feel like we get insight into your personal life as well on social media. Your babies, toddlers are so cute, right? 
What have they taught you about just being an entrepreneur and how have they changed the way you approach and design jewelry as well? Having children is a huge lesson in patience and that, that helps in all areas of life as you grow a team and learning to manage people. As I design, I'm definitely keeping in mind like, is my son going to be able to pull this off my neck? Is my daughter <laughs> gonna yank this out of my ear? Those are considerations. I want the jewelry to be able to be worn and loved. And so you do have to think about the practicality of things too. I, I love that practical, but still fashionable at the same time. Let's get into some top trends for fall. What can we expect in the jewelry department for fall? Okay, so obviously we've seen Y2K has been a huge part of the fashion trend throughout the year. I think that's going to continue. Lots of colors and throwbacks with butterflies a lot of chunky chains. Um, and going into fall, I see, you know, some more muted color. In particular, we have designed some of our best sellers with some more fall tones. So our electric hoop, which I'm wearing. Yeah, let's get into the product selections that you have. And that was a beautiful segue. Let's talk about this electric hoop, absolutely stunning. So is this for everyday wear or are these pieces for like special occasions? These are totally for everyday wear. And I think most of the jewelry that I design is intended to be worn as much as you possibly can. And that's even something I do with sort of the dressier pieces. This is actually titanium. Wow. Um, and it, it's finished with an anodized finish. So that's what gives it its fun color. So we have a whole spectrum of colors. And for fall, we're introducing this really fun, like caramel copper color. And I also love how lightweight it feels as well. It really is incredible. Let's move on and talk about the enamel box hoops as well. So when it comes to color, Stephanie, I'd love to hear your insight. Since these do have colors, should we do a whole monochromatic sort of look? Should we mix and match colors? Lead us, show us the way. Jewelry is the perfect place for you to pop a little bit of color. So, you know, throw on a red hoop with whatever, you know, more basic outfit you're wearing. If it's a black long sleeve t-shirt or a white sweater with denim, that's what I like to do with jewelry is let that be the shining star of your everyday dressing. That's such a good tip. I, I love that. Let's talk about accessories as well. This is a really clever product. Is this for working out? How do I rock this, Stephanie? Okay, so this is the arm candy band. We designed this with the intention of putting your engagement ring inside when you are exercising, getting your nails done. And that is something that we tell our brides is take that ring off whenever you can, but at least now you have a safe place to put it. So I keep one of these in every purse that I own. And that way, if I ever need a safe place to stick my ring or even my diamond studs, I've got that here. It has this little zipper, keep it on your wrist um, and you don't have to worry. You know what? I know a bride to be, and this is gonna be her gift. That's such a brilliant idea. Speaking of brilliant, this red nail polish, Essie is one of my favorites. Is it matte? Is it shiny? Let's talk about it. Okay, this is not ready for bed. It lasts the longest. This is a matte finish. This to me is just like the quintessential fall red color. Ah, it's such a beautiful color. I can just imagine when you're getting your pumpkin spice latte, you have your red nail polish. It's a whole situation. Let's move on to the bobble bar iPhone case. Are these customizable or are the names sort of preset? Yes, these are entirely customizable. And that is something we do with our jewelry too. Anything that you can customize for yourself is something that you will get excited about. So I love this collection. They have such cute cases with different designs. Like I have this one with B for my husband. You can put your kids' names or initials or even just a mantra. The possibilities are endless. All right, let's talk about these sneakers. These are men's and women's sneakers. Now I've seen these on my social media. Are these meant for running? Are they a style statement? Okay, so the sock sneaker has been around for a while. These are so inexpensive. They are so comfy. Yeah, they come in a million different colors and they're just great to kick around. I'm not sure about running, but this is more of like an athleisure sneaker. I think about people that are going back to school, maybe going to college. This is a great walking around sneaker. And when you talk about back to school and back to college or just the beginning of fall as well, this puffer jacket is absolutely great. And since you're so stylish, I gotta get your input. How do you style this? Okay, I love this jacket. This also comes in a lot of different colors. You know, I want my fall fashion to be bright and happy, a continuation of summer. So for me, the pink would be my go-to. 
I would kind of, you know, puff up the sleeves a little bit. It's a little bit oversized and cool. Wear it open until it gets cold and then throw on, a, you know, a cool chunky scarf with it. Stephanie, this has been such a treat. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was so fun. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. All right, you guys, now let's run through all the products one more time. We have the Stephanie Gottlieb jewelry, the arm candy cuff, the SD nail polish, the bobble bar iPhone case, the sock sneakers, and the puffer jacket. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. Up next, Erica Domasek shows us how to add our own flair to fall from caramel apples, yum, to Halloween cookies. I'm here for it. I'm staying for those. Don't go away. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about, and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. mornings they're full of possibility and how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day we feel like we're right there with you because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours for breaking news in our changing world download the NBC News app Welcome back. I'm lifestyle expert and founder of PSI Made This, Erica Domasek. I'm falling for fall, and with all the sights and flavors of the season in full swing, I've got fun food crafts that will level up your hosting and the whole family can get in on. And remember, see that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Let's get to it. Let's start with hosting. If you're having a Halloween party, you have to get on board with the Snack-O-Lantern. It's such a fun way to feed a crowd. It's honestly one of my favorite projects and I do it every season. First up, you're gonna need to get a big board. Now this one here is awesome because it has a ring, which is actually a lip that's gonna hold in your food. What we're gonna do is actually create a Snack-O-Lantern on top of this using all your favorite snacks. Now, use what you have in your pantry, go to the grocery store, anything works. The big tip here is that you wanna use black and orange, obviously for Halloween. So to get started, first you need to make your outline of your eyes and your smile. I chose licorice, and we're just gonna fill it in with some chocolate covered raisins. You can really use anything that you love. For me, I think the fun part of this is that kids can do this, families can do this, and it is such a showstopper when you bring it over to someone's house or if you keep it to your own house for a party. Now, once you get the eyes set and you get your smile, these are Oreo cookies here, fill in with other fun orange things. For me, I chose the things that my family loves. Honestly, anything orange works. 
I've got some chocolate here, pretzels. It is the cutest platter, and I promise everybody will freak out. And I hope you love making your snack lantern. We have a new take on gingerbread houses, the Haunted Manor. Now, I'm so excited about this. It just launched from Fancy Sprinkles. This is a kit that is going to wow everybody this season. Now, it comes with molds, easy candy to melt, everything you need right here. You simply put it in your microwave. I like to do it at half power, 30 second intervals until it's completely melted like you see here. You're going to snip the top and very carefully, you're going to pour it right into your mold. See how easily it comes out? Super fun. Now you want to make sure you fill it to the top. And once you fill it to the top, the kit doesn't come with this, but everybody needs to own a mini offset spatula. You might even have one already. You're simply going to get it nice and smooth in there. And you want to make sure you get into all the little crevices and the corners for a smooth panel. Now you've got a couple different panels on both of these. Now, once they're all completely full, you put them in the refrigerator. Now, just know, it only is gonna come with this dark chocolate color, but you can go to your craft store and get candy melts in so many different colors. As you can see here, I've got purple and green, orange, purple, anything works. Now, when everything's set, you're gonna bring them out. See how hard they are? They pop right out, super easy. And put them on a surface, a cutting board or a cookie tray, and it's time for the decoration part. This one is really fun because we've got these taste safe brushes that you're simply gonna dip into your luster. I like to start with gold and fill in all the details. Now they've already been set for you. So it's really easy to follow. You can do medium sized brushes. You can do little brushes. This is so fun for kids. I love this idea if you're having a bunch of people over in a party, everybody can make one. You simply fill in the ridges and it really comes alive with these colors. You want to dust on in areas that you want to pop. There are windows. It's all fun. I love this so much. Now, when it's totally decorated and all your pieces are good to go, it's time to put it together. Now, just like a gingerbread house, we're not going to use icing. We're going to go back to the easy candy, melt it again, and that's our glue. So we simply glue each piece together. Don't worry, the directions are in the box, so you'll, you'll know where to put everything. And the really fun part, you get to decorate it with the fancy sprinkles. This blend has really fun colors, even little graves in it. You're gonna use your candy as your glue and sprinkle all the decorations on top to stick so it looks exactly like this. And by the way, you can eat this for weeks. You can keep it on a counter. This also makes for an amazing gift to bring to a house. Hope you guys have fun with it. And of course, we have everyone's fall favorites, the classic candy apples. We have two special versions to share with you today. Let's get into it. Now, this one is the Caramel Apple Kit. It's my personal favorite, grew up eating these. You get six different sticks, all the ingredients you see here, so you can make an entire platter for your whole family or a fun little get together. Now, to get started, you're simply gonna take your stick, put it right into the top of your apple. Make sure to remove the little stem you're gonna kind of get it in there and then push in really forcefully, just like that. And you wanna make sure it's about halfway in. There you go, it's not going anywhere. Now, you wanna make sure your caramel is totally melted. Put it in your microwave for about 30 second intervals, full power until it's nice and liquidy. Now here's the fun part. We're going right in there and you're simply gonna get your apple completely covered in the caramel. Give it a nice twist, just like that. It's super gooey. Oh my gosh, it smells amazing already. Now for toppings, we have two selections. The kit comes with either sprinkles or chopped nuts. If you have allergies, don't need to do those. Just stick with the sprinkles. And we're simply gonna roll in just like this and it sticks so quick and it looks so cute. Ah, I'm loving this. Take a look, you're gonna put it right on your tray. Let it set and that's it. Next up, we have the Golden Apple Kit. Now, Fancy Sprinkles makes this amazing and easy. It comes with six golden sticks, your same easy candy we used before in the Haunted Mansion, and some gold luster dust. Now, just like before, you're gonna microwave it, melt it, but this time, you're gonna clip it, pour it in a bowl, because we're gonna dip it just like that caramel we did before. Now, before you dip it, you obviously need to put the stick in there. These sticks have two sides. There's a metallic blue mirrored and we have the gold. Now take a look at it. There comes with a little foil. You're gonna rip that off, 
and then you can see that beautiful golden shimmer. And it really just goes right in there. You might need a little force to get it in there. Now, as you can see, ours is totally set. Refrigerate them for 10 minutes and you're golden. Now for the fun part. I'm simply gonna take my golden luster dust. And yes, of course it's edible. Watch the magic happen. Are you ready? You're simply gonna paint it on and in seconds, this beautiful hue of metallic gold covers it. Dust it just like this. This is so fun for a party. This is an amazing gift to buy. Take a look at that. It takes seconds. It looks so gorgeous, super luxe, and it's pretty yummy too. And lastly, if you need to keep the kids busy and full, we've got a kit that will do it all. I've got a paint your own Halloween cookie kit that is so fun. Now the kit comes with sugar cookies that have stencils already on there to fill in and some blank ones. But the innovation is a actual palette of edible food dye with paintbrushes. So you can go right in there. Imagine it's like a watercolor kit, but all edible. So how do you do this? You simply take your cookie. I chose this cute pumpkin design. You're gonna take your paintbrush. You're gonna dip it into water. As you see, I have a couple colors here. So I have a couple different waters because we don't want the colors to get all messed up. I'm gonna choose orange, obviously for the pumpkin, and I'm simply gonna paint it right onto my cookie. Look how cute this is. It comes to life like this. Now, these are the type of kits that I think are perfect for parties. Kids love them. Again, this kit from William Sonoma makes for an amazing gift. I love this as a hostess gift. And they dry in seconds. Now, for your next color, you can use a different brush or go back in there to rinse it off. I'm just gonna again wet that, put it right back on this palette. By the way, the palette is a cookie too, so you can eat that. And we're gonna maybe just do a green brim. Have fun with them. Also, if you have littler kids who maybe can't stay in the lines, it comes with blank cookies so they can go crazy. Regardless, anything you do is gonna come out super fun and or really yummy too. So have fun this Halloween with all of these amazing snacks. They're creative, they're fun, they're a little spooky, and everyone is gonna eat them up. Let's run through everything we talked about one more time. We've got the Snack-O-Lantern, the Haunted Manor, the Candy Apples, and to paint your own cookie kit. And that's a wrap on Buy and DIY. And for our show, it's been so fun sharing all of our favorites with you. Make sure to tune in next week for an all new episode of Shop All Day. Thanks for watching. Do you see this? See this pizza? You wanna eat this pizza? Too bad, I'm going to. <laughs> I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Who doesn't just love ooey, gooey, and totally decadent cheese? I know you do. Americans truly can't get enough, in fact, We've tripled our cheese consumption since the 70s. Today, the average person here eats a whopping 35 pounds of cheese a year. 35! So it's no surprise that cheese is usually one of the toughest things to give up if you're ditching dairy. But I've got some good news for you. These days, there are a lot of tasty options out there when it comes to vegan cheese. And I'm determined to explore them all. Well, maybe not all, but I've discovered a few really, really good ones. I'm checking out a new type of pizza shop serving up killer pies. Then, I'll be using cashews to make an irresistible dairy-free dip of my own. But first, I'm headed to Riverdale, an artisanal cheese shop making its mark on the plant-based cheese world. Michaela Grobe is the owner and cheesemonger of Riverdale, a vegan cheese shop on Manhattan's Lower East Side. It's the only shop in New York City that exclusively features dairy-free artisanal cheeses. Michaela, thank you for having me. I love a plant-based cheese moment. This is very exciting for me. <laughs> Tell me about what inspired you to start Riverdale. Basically, I love cheese. Um, I love animals. I became vegan for 40 animals, basically. And when I 
Then started looking around for cheese. I found that, you know, it was, it was out there, but you couldn't really access it easily. Michaela's quest for better vegan cheese started a decade ago, when it was still really hard to find dairy-free cheese that was actually good. While working a high-profile job in the corporate world, Michaela saw an opportunity to open a new type of store. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if there would be one place, just like any other tea shop, where everything's vegan? And that's kind of where the idea came from. She began reading books on vegan cheesemaking and took classes with acclaimed vegan chefs. On the weekends, Michaela went through a lot of trial and error in her home kitchen, while also crafting a plan to start her own food business. I still had my corporate job and at one point I was like, okay, I think it's time for me to leave the corporate world and really do something about it. I really thought, I want to I wanna try it. If, it. if it fails, it fails, right? But at least I tried it. With enough money saved, she left her job in 2015 and opened Riverdale, named after her two pets, a dog named River and her cat Fidel. But Michaela's mission to make vegan cheese more accessible wasn't just a passion project. It was a pivotal time for a booming business. In 2017, vegan cheese sales hovered around $294 million. By 2022, that figure is projected to reach nearly 600 million. That's a 100% increase. Are you trying to mimic, you know, dairy cheese, or are you kind of creating something in your own line, in your own world? Yeah. Um, or are you just trying to replicate the experience of buying cheese? Yeah. It's a little bit of, of everything. It's the experience, it's a product that people know, uh, that looks like a brie, that looks like a, a gouda. But then there are also other cheeses that have no equivalent in the dairy world. Riverdale's blue cheese uses the same fungus that creates the iconic navy marbling in the dairy version. But the shop's Vitopian is a cashew and soy-based cheese with a unique texture that's semi-firm yet creamy. The way I like to explain our customers is to not look for like for like um, imitation. It's the same as if you would make a, a gouda from a cow's milk and from a goat's milk. It has the same techniques, the same cultures, but the end product is very different. So it's the same if your base is a cashew nut. The end products are different, but it's still a cheese, in my, my view at least. Who do you want to be eating this cheese? I mean, we definitely have a lot of vegan customers, but we also have people that are vegetarian, um, lactose intolerant. So whereas we do obviously speak to the vegan community, um, for me it was also important that we reach out and connect with the non-vegan community. You're targeting the cheese curious. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that it's difficult to make the switch because people are afraid of like, oh my God, what am I gonna eat? Michaela has the cheesy answer to that question. In the shop's kitchen, she showed me how to make a few of her handcrafted cheeses. Okay, Michaela, what are we making today? So we're actually making a feta today. It's gonna be a very salty and crumbly and firm one, which is perfect for salads. Vegan cheesemongers use a variety of ingredients to mimic the taste and texture of dairy cheese. Common bases include a combo of nuts, vegetable oils, and soy products. So for this one, we're actually using tofu. This tofu has been frozen first, and then we kind of squeeze out all the liquid so it becomes very dry. Michaela uses firm tofu to create a sturdy feta. It allows the cheese to uniformly slice and dice, but also crumble, just like the traditional Greek cheese. For flavor, Michaela adds Himalayan salt, red wine vinegar, garlic powder, and Greek oregano. Then there are two types of fats. So you're using coconut oil here. Why are mm -hmm. you using coconut and not a different kind of oil or fat? Yeah, I mean, coconut oil um, firms up once it's chilled. Mm -hmm. So it really helps with just making the cheese firmer. All right, so I've got some olive oil here. Mm -hmm. And it's just olive oil with a little bit of oregano in it. And it's just to get a little bit more flavor. And I'm just using a, like a, a tablespoon or something like that. Okay, so we're ready to blend our feta. Mm -hmm. Everyone's gonna become friends in here. Mm -hmm. What are we yeah. looking for for it to be done and how long are we processing for? 
So we're looking for a very smooth, almost shiny kind of consistency. Even when I think it's done, I usually like to give it another minute or two just to be on the, uh, on the safe side. You can't over blend this. Michaela scrapes down the processor every minute or so to ensure the mixture reaches a smooth, creamy consistency. Then it's transferred into cheese molds. We made two flavors, one plain and one with an olive tapenade center. The cheeses sit in the fridge for two days to firm up. I made some ahead already, oh, so we don't have to wait overnight and we can taste them right away. Oh, exciting. So this is what it looks oh. like when you turn it upside down. What? So this is one with the um, tapenade layer. Oh. And here is one with uh, sun-dried tomatoes. Wait, this is crazy how firm it is. Yeah. Can we eat them? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. Will you have some with me? I want to so, try this one. Yeah, you but, try that one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mmm. Mm. So it's nice and salty. Wow, that's crazy. Crumbly, but it doesn't taste anything like the other uh, the tofu that we use as a base. It feels very light, but still like dense enough to mm -hmm. be like, oh wow, like I'm eating something that could really stand up to a dairy yeah. cheese. Yeah. This is so delicious. My mind is blown. You have so many different types of cheeses. Can we try some mm. other ones too? Oh, absolutely. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You'll get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. I love you too. <laughs> Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You'll get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> a masked killer takes aim at fires. A fatal attraction that leads investigators to turn towards their own. Internal Affairs, a new podcast from Dateline. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. At Riverdale, a vegan cheese shop in New York City, owner Michaela Grobe makes two cheeses in-house. She also imports over a dozen varieties from across the country and around the world. I'm genuinely freaking out because this all looks like real cheese. <laughs> like, talk to me about what we're seeing here. So this one is another one of our house-made cheeses. It's, it's a it's a blue cheese type and it's aged for about, well, two to three months. It's definitely more on the funkier side. The uh, base ingredient here is cashews. Then we have a brie style here. The cultures that are being used for, to create this nice fluffy rind mm. is the same as you would use on a dairy application. This one's uh, from Texas and it actually has um, cashews and rice flour. Oh, what kind of cheese is this? So that's a smoky aged cheddar style, very nice and firm and very strong and uh, deep flavor. And here we have one that's made in New York and it's made from macadamia nuts and hemp. Mm. And it has a little bit, little bit of a kick, a little bit of a spice, something like along the lines of a pepper jack. I'm very excited to try them. How are we gonna assemble it? Can we make like a little cute cheese platter or something Oh yeah, like absolutely. We have a few things that will go really nicely with each of those cheeses. Nice. Riverdale also carries many cheese board essentials, including crackers, jams, and vegan charcuterie. I would Absolutely. have a party just to serve this. It was almost time to dive in, but you already know, my camera always eats first. I think I have to start with the pepper jack because yeah, I love spice. Yeah, Absolutely. So it is a bit spicy. I'm okay. Yeah, especially I'm, the crust is, is going to be spicy. I'm ready for it. Whoa. Yeah? Once I get started, I just can't stop. 
Vegan blue with strawberries, anyone? Cheers. Cheers. Oh my god. <laughs> That doesn't make sense. And we had to pair the Brie with Pear. Michaela, you have changed my world today. This is so <laughs> exciting. Um, Great. And I just can't thank you enough. This is incredible. And I, I hope people really see all the amazing things you're doing with vegan cheese. I'm really happy to have so many more cheese makers. We find so many more cheese makers like every month. There's a new one we start working with. Thank you so much. If you ever need more tasters, I'll be sure to Just call like yes. hit me up. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be here. <laughs> I've saved a little room for my next cheesy stop. A New York pizza shop firing up plant based pies for their screaming fans. A masked killer takes aim and fires. A fatal attraction that leads investigators to turn towards their own. Internal Affairs, a new podcast from Dateline. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about, and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. <laughs> Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. I live in Brooklyn, and there are few foods that scream New York City more than pizza. But is pizza really pizza without cheese? Vegan cheeses may be delicious, but capturing the melty, gooey goodness of mozzarella is tough. And that's obviously essential for a perfect pie. Meet one of my favorite vegan pizza spots, Screamers. Come on. Are you kidding? Is it a joke? It's not a joke. It's vegan. <laughs> Open since 2016, Screamers is similar to many iconic slice spots all over the city. Head chef Joy Strang has worked at Screamers for four years. She developed popular pies on the menu, like the Truffle Scream, a pizza covered in oyster and cremini mushrooms, plant-based parm, arugula, and a drizzle of fragrant truffle oil. Tell me about the inspiration behind Screamers. I mean, the inspiration was literally just that. It was a bunch of vegans sitting around wanting to um, have a really good slice of New York pizza, and thus Screamers was born, you know? What was your background before Screamers? Uh, so I spent a lot of time as a chef for a Mexican restaurant, and I've also worked in American fine dining. But I also find that like, cooking vegan food, you just take the same methods that you use for cooking anything and just apply it to vegan ingredients. Screamer serves all types of pies, from classics like pepperoni and a fully loaded supreme, to mashup flavors, like a Reuben pie topped with spiced seitan and Thousand Island dressing. They have two locations in Brooklyn and a dedicated following on social media. 
How far has somebody traveled to get some Screamers pizza? We get people from all over. Brazil um, is notable, uh, Germany. And I always feel badly for people that are traveling from out of town when they come here because then they eat the pizza and then they have to think about the pizza when they go home. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm really sorry for They you know. ruin people. Yeah. What do you say, Joy, to people who are skeptical of vegan cheese? Because obviously cheese is a huge part of pizza. I'd say, honestly, that's probably our number one challenge is people come in and they're like, oh, I don't know about the cheese, but vegan cheese has come a long way. You know, um, before there weren't as many options, but I think there's so much more focus and emphasis on making things more delicious these days as opposed to just having a alternative. Screamers uses a specific vegan cheese to replicate the texture of dairy cheese. So we use a uh, BioLife mozzarella. Oh, nice. Yeah. So we've tried many, many cheeses, but this seems to be the one with the best smell, the best, best mouth feel, I think. What is it made out of? Coconut oil and potato starch is the base of it. So again, it's very allergy friendly, um, no soy, no nuts. Screamers also makes two cheeses in-house, an almond-based Parmesan and an ultra creamy ricotta. Today we're gonna make our almond ricotta, um, which goes on a lot of our four pizzas. Yay, I'm yeah. excited. Okay, so I see you've soaked the almonds to soften them, but they're also blanched as well. There's no skin on them. So why is that happening there? Yeah, because the skin tends to, one, um, give you like a little bit of a, a different mouthfeel. It's, um, it's a little bit, uh, yeah, a little bit grainy and also just for color purposes. Okay, should we get started? What are we doing first? So we're gonna put in our um, soaked and blanched almonds into the Robo Poop. All right, and then okay. next we're gonna go with our salt. Lactic acid goes in there next. Why are we using lactic acid here? So it gives it a little bit of a tang, you know, that um, you know every cheese tends to have. We achieve that by putting the lactic acid in there. All right. Yeah. And then this is the blended oil. It's a little bit of vegetable oil and a little bit of um, olive oil. And then we're just gonna snap the lid on here. The mixture blends for a couple minutes. Once everything gets creamy, it's time for a taste. Are we done? Yeah, we're looks done. It's delicious. You want to give it a try? I really would. All right. I thought you never asked. Yeah, for sure. Mmm. Pretty good, right? Very creamy like ricotta. Joy, it feels wrong to have cheese without the pizza. For so sure. what can we put this almond ricotta on top of? Well, we're going to show you one of our most popular pizzas, like we mentioned before, the buffalo cauliflower. Um, yeah, so we'll use the cheese that we just made for that. All right, what are we starting with? So um, this is the, our dough. We make all of our dough in-house. I'd say the most challenging part about making pizza at home is probably stretching the dough, mm -hmm. right? So you want to start by flouring both sides so it doesn't stick. Um, and then we're going to press out all of the air bubbles. And while pressing out the air bubbles, you're kind of like keeping it in this circle shape. So it makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to stretch and still be formed into this like perfect, beautiful circle. All right, so now that we've gotten our air bubbles out here, we're gonna flip it over on our hand and start the stretching process. It's like you literally do this in your sleep. I know, I mean, I probably could, I probably have. All right, so wow. there we are. Did yeah. you just see that though? That was like in two seconds. What is the trick to spreading sauce pr appropriately okay. and well? So you want to, I always start in the middle and then I, I circle out like this and I push, um, push the sauce to the sides. This is like a little bit of like hypnosis going on. <laughs> yeah, so take a big handful of the cheese and I will say, I'm gonna give you a little cheese spreading advice here. Okay. You wanna start high and then just kind of sprinkle it all around so you get an even coat, okay? Okay, all right. You're doing great. Okay, yeah, I was <laughs> looking for affirmation really quick. Yes, I, you're doing a great job. Can you see that? The pizza gets a few generous dollops of that luscious ricotta. How does this bake off? Well, it actually gets a little bit crispy on top, which makes it so, so delicious. Okay, what's next? All right, so then we're going to put our uh, buffalo cauliflower on top. Oh. Yeah. Okay, tell me about how you prepare the cauliflower. Okay, for sure. So we make our own buffalo sauce here, and we take, um, we break down cauliflower, and we cook the cauliflower in buffalo sauce. How hot is this oven, and how long are we keeping our pizza in there for? So we keep the oven between 500 and 550, um, and it's going to cook for about six, six, six or seven minutes. Okay. Yeah, so super quick. Quick. Yep, and then it'll be nice, crispy, and uh, golden brown on the edges, and that's how you know it's done. The seven minute wait, it felt like eternity. How's it doing in there? Oh, she, oh. she, she beautiful. All right, let's take one more peek at the bottom here. What oh. do you think? I think it looks gorgeous. I think she's What beautiful. do you think? I think I think she's ready. Joy, I've got to document this process. Okay. It's just simply a part of my brand. Okay, do it. All right, you ready? I'm ready. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. <laughs>
<laughs> that looks so fire. Are you kidding me? I know, right? The pizza is served up in true New York style. You're not eating off of a paper plate. Are you eating pizza? Are you even eating a Are New York you? pizza? No. Amazing slice job. Boom. Come on. <laughs> what do you think? Stop. So good, right? This tastes like real pizza. Yeah. I don't even want to say real pizza. It just tastes, tastes like, like regular pizza. dairy pizza. Yeah. It's so good. It's so delicious. Yeah. What does it mean to you, Joy, to be creating this traditional New York slice that's vegan, that gives so many more people an option? It's awesome. I mean, when people come to New York, when people think about New York, one of the things they, they think about is pizza. You know, they want to check that box off. Oh, I had a New York pizza. So it's really, really awesome that we've given the option to every single person to be able to do that, you know? You know what I also really like uh, to hear is um, people who have dairy allergies or even parents with their children that have dairy allergies and they are always so happy that we exist because otherwise they wouldn't be able to have pizza and like a, such a big part of a kid like childhood is eating pizza, right? Yeah. Yeah. We do a lot of like uh, little kids pizza parties and stuff like that, cute. you know, it's so <laughs> cute. So, you know, it's like that little bit of normalcy. It's like, oh, I can't have dairy, but still have really good pizza. What are some of your favorite reactions from vegans and non-vegans alike who try your pizza for the first time? Like a non-vegan reaction, they are like, oh, it's actually good. And you're like, I told you so. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of people that come in and this is their favorite pizza spot and they are not vegan. If you can't travel to Brooklyn for a screamer's pie, don't worry, I've got your dairy-free cheese cravings covered. Up next, I'm making my super creamy cashew queso. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a masked killer takes aim and fires. A fatal attraction that leads investigators to turn towards their own. Internal Affairs, a new podcast from Dateline. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. One beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. One of my favorite things to make when I'm having friends over, if I want a really delicious snack by myself, is my roasted jalapeno queso. You might be wondering, a plant-based version of queso? Are you okay, Sama? But to that I say, I'm perfect. Chile con queso is a Tex-Mex classic that's traditionally made with a great melting cheese and green chilies. We're using cashews as the base and nutritional yeast for a cheesy, savory flavor. And jalapeno, I can't forget about our spice. It's super creamy and cheesy. You won't even miss the dairy. Because I like a little spice in everything that I do, we're adding jalapeno to our queso. I like roasting the jalapeno to get that really smoky, delicious flavor. You've got your jalapeno, drizzle it generously with some olive oil. I like to just rub the jalapeno in the oil just to get it nicely coated. All right, say goodbye to our jalapeno. It's about to get roasted. See you later. The jalapenos roast at 400 degrees for about 10 minutes until lightly charred. Look at our jalapeno. She's cooled. It's blackened on the outside. Also, you'll notice that when you let the jalapeno cool, it's gonna get a little wrinkly, that's totally fine. My secret weapon in creating a really delicious and creamy queso, cashews. I soak them either overnight or flash soak them for an hour in hot water. This allows the cashews to expand. They really get nice and pliable and soft. The first thing I'm gonna do is drain my cashews. 
Now I'm just gonna add them to my blender. Cashews are in, now I'm just gonna add two cloves of garlic. You might be wondering how I'm gonna make this queso cheesy without the cheese, and to that I say, nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast is one of my secret weapons in my plant-based repertoire. It's really amazing for creating a savory and cheesy taste to everything you add it to. Beautiful. This is such a super simple recipe, it's actually crazy. Everything's going into a blender. We're gonna add some salt and some freshly ground black pepper. And don't forget our gorgeous jalapeno. Now to help everything come together, I'm just adding a little bit of vegetable broth. You could use water, I just like using veggie broth because it adds some more taste, some more flavor, and we love more flavor when we're cooking, right? Beautiful. Now we get to blend. Are you excited? I'm excited. All right, let's blend. All right, let's check the texture. <gasps> Creamy, velvety, queso-y, not a word, but I have my own dictionary. I don't know if you knew that. It's beautiful. My chips have arrived. I'm ready to plate my queso and I'm very excited about it because then I get to eat it. And that's what we're all here for. Check out this texture, okay? <gasps> Are you checking it out? You sure? Creamy, cheesy, but no cream or cheese. Crazy. All right, I want this to look really cute, so I'm just gonna smooth the top out, the back of my spoon, like so. A very simple garnish, just a little bit of pepper. Could you believe it could be that easy? Cheesy, delicious, creamy queso, no dairy involved. Now I get to eat it. Here I go. Chip ready to take a dip. Hmm. <gasps> Do you see that? Wow. Ooh, that heat is so good. Mmm. This is in my cookbook, so I've obviously made this a bunch of times, but it's so good every time. Queso is perfect to share, so luckily I have my whole crew here. So guys, I don't know what you're doing. Get in here. Come on. That's more like it. <laughs> Teamwork, awesome. Love that for us. I hope this showed you can make really creamy, delicious, and cheesy recipes without the dairy. It's amazing. You have to try it. Not to be cheesy, or to be cheesy, I hope this inspired you to try cheese without the dairy because it is just as delicious and versatile. Good Thursday morning, all eyes are on the economy. Millions of families waiting to see what happens with those sky high prices.